up, everybody. We're about 45 seconds from air. Dial 1-800-825-5033. West of the Rockies, including Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico, 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers may reach out at area code 702-727-1222. And you may call out on the wild card line at area code 702-727-1295. To reach out from outside the U.S., first dial your access number to the USA. Then, 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM from the Kingdom of Nye with Art Bell. If you want to stay on this ride, you better have a strong heart. As my partner and I sat waiting for a call, I began to tell her the story that I'd seen on TV. But for some unknown reason, I couldn't remember the name of the hotel. At that moment, we got an emergency call. We ran the call, brought the patient to the hospital. The whole time, I'm trying to remember the name of that doggone hotel. Well, we arrive at the hospital and wheel the patient inside. As I'm giving my report to the nurse in the emergency room, I just happen to glance behind the desk, and hanging on the wall is a calendar. And the full-color, large picture on the calendar is, you guessed it, the Hotel Del Coronado. Well, I tend to pay attention to these little things and took this as an invitation from Kate to visit her hotel. So, I reserved one of their smallest, cheapest rooms, and the next time I had a four-day weekend, I packed up my convertible, drove down the coast from San Francisco to San Diego, arrived at the hotel, went up to the desk to check in, and the clerk says, Oh, I'm sorry. All of the small, cheap rooms, like the one you had reserved, are booked up. Hmm. Let me see. Oh, we do have this suite with a balcony overlooking the courtyard in the old section of the hotel. Will that be all right? <laughs> he said, I'll give it to you for the same price as the small, cheap, cheesy room you had reserved. Naturally, I say, okay, and I'm beginning to think this is going to be a very interesting stay. So... Up I go, took a bubble bath, drank a beer out of the room bar. Shouldn't do that, by the way, they're terribly expensive. Jumped on the bed, as is my habit any time I stay in an expensive hotel. I took a nap and got dressed for dinner. Went down to the bar for a cocktail. The bartender brought all of my drinks. Had dinner in one of the restaurants, and when I asked for my check, the waiter told me that a gentleman who had been seated across the room had Paid the check. The rest of the visit was uneventful. No apparitions, no funky stuff, until the stay at the hotel never showed up on my credit card bill. Now, I'm a relatively honest person, and under normal circumstances, I probably would have called the Hotel Del Coronado, told them about their oversight. However, when viewed with everything else that occurred, 
the calendar, the upgrade, the free drinks, the free dinner. It was rather apparent to me that I had indeed been a guest, Kate's guest, at the Hotel Del Coronado. She is a fine hostess, and I hope to return one of these days. And I have, of course, many more like this. And uh, if any of you have a particularly good ghost story, we're going to do uh, we're going to do two things. One, we are going to tell ghost stories uh, from those of you who call on the call-in lines, and we are going to also invite you, uh, rather than sending in a fax with your ghost story, if you have a particularly good one, send me a fax with your phone number, and I will call you open. So wherever you are in the world, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, if you have a ghost story, and I do have one sent to me here by uh, from Belgium, I've got another one from South Africa, all lines, all night, all ghost stories. Here we go. First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. This is Kay calling from Eugene, Oregon. Hello, Kay. How are you? You're going to have to get good and close to the phone because you're not too loud. How's this? That's better. All right. Well, my boyfriend's brother, he moved into this house in Providence, Rhode Island. And come to find out, it's, it used to be a funeral home. And, like, they have the places, like, in the basement where, you know, they burn the bodies and did all that crazy stuff. Cremation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, um... Now he feels like there's a ghost there. Um, like things will be missing, like things you don't misplace, like toothpaste, cutting board, just gone. Gone. And um, one time his roommate, you know, they were just sitting there drinking coffee. His roommate went to his room because he finished his cup and he came back out and it was completely filled, hot. Jason didn't get it for him or anything. And it wasn't even made right how he likes it. And he says sometimes, you know, like a door will slam. Um, one time he, like, he actually had to leave because he was so scared because there was, like, rubbing all on the walls and clanging noises. You know, let me tell you a little story back now. Okay. I saw a movie the other night. I can't recall the name of it, unfortunately. Now a million people will send it to me. But uh, it was about a man who went to work in a morgue. Uh-huh. And he was a guard in the morgue, mm -hmm. and he would have his little guard desk, and he'd have his little, you know, guards have keys, and they have to make the rounds and turn the key so that the owner knows they really made their assigned rounds at night. And he had a desk and a workstation uh, when he wasn't having to make his rounds, and there was this red light behind him. And in the morgue, they would have the bodies all lined up on these cots covered with sheets in a cold, what's called a cold room. Mm -hmm. But above each body, there was a pull cord. You know, some, a cord you could pull. Just in case. Just in case. And uh, should, uh, should somebody pull that cord, it would obviously mean to the guy sitting at the desk that one of the bodies in the morgue had reanimated, not unheard of. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you any more than that, but I will tell you, it went off. Wow. <laughs> okay? Yeah, it's pretty weird. And well, I don't, is there, like, who would you go about calling? Say if you wanted to have, like, a specialist come in there and see, you know, what was going on. Any ideas? Oh, yes. I have many people. In fact, the guests I'm going to have on this coming Monday night... Uh, uh, might be exactly uh, the person you're looking for. Yeah, it's pretty crazy because, you know, they his, have... His name now, listen to me, is Jerome Clark, and he wrote a book called Unexplained Strange Sightings, Incredible Occurrences, and Puzzling Physical Phenomena. Now, he'll be here Monday night, uh, Tuesday morning next week. Okay. Somebody like that is the kind of person you need, okay? Definitely. Thanks so much for your help. You bet. Take care, and uh, good luck. Wild Card Line, you're on the air. Yes, Art, this is Greg from El Cajon, California. Hi, Greg. How are you, Art? Just fine. I have a good one for you. Okay. Do I have about four or five minutes? You do. Excellent. Um, my wife's mother, 
uh, had died back in uh, February, actually on February 13th of this year. And prior to her death, uh, my wife and children and I had stayed with her overnight in, in that house on many occasions. Sure. It was just a normal home, nothing strange, uh, very comfortable there, had no problems whatsoever. You would just be visiting her and stay, stay the night? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, but taking up the house uh, at the time of her death uh, went into probate. And, of course, uh, my wife and her siblings not wanting to uh, leave the house empty, of course, because of vandals and that sort of thing. Uh, my wife and our two daughters and our unborn son uh, moved into that empty house on March 1st of this year. Makes sense. Um, shortly after, my family and I took occupancy of the home. Uh, certain events uh, started to take place. Like what? Well, um, just to paraphrase you also, at this time, on around March 10th, we adopted a, a German Shepherd Beagle mix um, that uh, uh, it made my wife feel a lot better, of course, uh, because I work late at night, sometimes till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm, like me. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. And uh, it gave her a peace of mind uh, because the uh, house was out in the country. Okay. Like her me. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Within the first two weeks uh, that we took up residence in uh, my wife's uh, deceased mother's home, uh, my wife would uh, relay to me from time to time that she felt as she was being watched intensely. I myself, uh, at the time, being a complete skeptic, uh, dismissed the information as an overactive imagination, which I probably should not have. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, my belief until the evening of March 16th, uh, 1998, when my eyes were widely opened. Um, on that evening, uh, I was having dinner with my wife and children, and my sister-in-law and her two children, uh, teenage children, were um, over to the house for dinner, uh, just you know, a few weeks after moving into the house. Uh, everyone had left uh, but my wife and I, and I was sitting in a position in the dining room at the dining room table area that allowed me to look all the way down the hallway into uh, one of three bedrooms, which was my uh, youngest daughter's at the time. Sure. <clears throat> at that point, I saw something that is so hard for me to describe. It was an aura of what seemed to be a woman's form with a lot to me of what seemed to be energy. Around in other words, form. indistinct kind of a... A foggy light aura. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. And it, are, it definitely was it, it was, it seemed to be the shape of a woman to me. Mm -hmm. I was so motionless and locked into what was happening at the time that I almost lost relative consciousness of what or where I was except for what was going on in that room. My wife was sitting over to the right of me and asked me what I had seen, and I described it to her, and she said something to the effect of, you too? Which, you, you too? Yeah. You mean she saw it as well? She had seen and felt things before me, and yet had never, over that period of time, that two-week period since we'd moved in there. Can you, uh, can you hang on through the break? Absolutely, Art. Stay right where you are. When one sees it, you can imagine a bit of undigested meat. When two see it, well... My suggestion, turn the lights down, turn the radio up, get as comfortable as you can, because some of what you hear is going to require you be in a nice, comfortable place. By the way, with respect to my story about the Hotel Del Coronado, I just got this high art. My sister-in-law actually works at the Hotel Del Coronado as a concierge. She says the ghost stories are real, and you can even, if you wish it, rent, I repeat, you can rent the haunted room. That's from Jeff in Amherst, Ohio. wonder if that's really true. Thank you, Jeff. And by the way, for any of you who have ghost stories out there, uh, just uh, uh, send me a fax and tempt me. Tell me how good it is and give me a phone number. And if I 
am tempted enough, I will call you and get you on the air. My fax number is area code 702-727-8499. If you can't tempt me in one page, you can't do it, so hold it to one page. And now, back to the gentleman who saw the apparition down the hall in the bedroom and then turned to his wife, and his wife saw it too, right, sir? Yes, she had seen it, but it was uh, at a different time. And so then what? I mean, did you sit there and compare notes with her or what? Well, I had the hair was standing up on the back of my neck, Art. I'm sure it was. And I uh, I, I didn't know what to think. I just moved my, my wife and my children into uh, a house, and uh, I didn't know how long I was going to be there. Did you think about getting out? You know, I, at that point, I really didn't know. Uh, you, you know what? Um, I, I Actually... It's so easy to say, man, I'd be out of there like a shot. But the fact of the matter is, there are financial considerations. There are physical considerations. You have a wife. You have children. You have a lot of furniture. You've moved into a house. So you don't just immediately make a decision to split. Let me tell you, Art, the, the rest of my notes that I have here for you that I compiled today, you're going to think more and more why we didn't uh, actually get out. On, uh, on or around March 22nd, I was alone in the house, and my wife had left with her sister and uh, my children. They went over visiting for the day. Mm -hmm. It was around the noon hour. I was uh, preparing to leave for work. I'd just come out of the restroom that adjoined our master bedroom. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, our bedroom used to be my deceased mother-in-law's bedroom. Oh. In a fairly quick instance, as I looked over my right shoulder, and I, I can see this as plainly as the day that, in my mind, is the day that I did see it, in just a few seconds' time, I saw my deceased mother-in-law leaning over the dresser area where her dresser used to be in her room. Mm -hmm. And it, it appeared as if she was leaning over to place something down. This time she was of more form? Yes. Uh-huh. Shortly thereafter, that situation, our uh, interesting and strange phenomenon began to occur. Uh, my deceased mother-in-law had there was a beautiful type plush white carpet, very white carpet in her home. Mm -hmm. It was throughout the home. Um, there was no variance throughout any of the rooms whatsoever. And I, I'm just giving the details so the listeners understand what I'm, I'm about to say. One morning, I would believe it was the end of March, first of April. My wife said, honey, come look at this. And I said, well, when you walk barefoot on the carpet art, it, it would leave a, almost a type of imprint of your foot. I understand exactly what you're saying, yes. And so we experimented a little bit. This was not my wife's footprint art. It wasn't my footprint. And it was much too large to either be either of my daughters. Sure. So we just stood there looking down, and my wife said, I know it's my mother's. I know it's my mother's footprint, and she lived with her mother until she married me, and until she was, you know, 19 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, she felt that, you know, also too, from that time on, that the constant set of eyes or being watched was all the more ever present. Our dog, on many occasions, or it would stand up and stare across the house into our bedroom, whining, staring. No, I, I, I'm going to ask, it's an embarrassing question. You don't have to ask, answer this, but um, if, if it was your wife's mother yes, sir. haunting the house, it, present in the house, uh, didn't that kind of um, take the edge off moments of intimacy for your wife? Well... At that time, Art, uh, and like I, that, that is a, <laughs> a personal question. My wife uh, was only about three months from delivering our son. I see. You, was, you, you, you say no more. That's she fine. Was very pregnant. Otherwise, uh, I can imagine there would be a problem. I, I can understand what you're saying, and I, I do, I do uh, agree to that. With that, to mom, mom, if you, if you're listening, you know what I mean. Okay. Yes. In the summer months. Another factor started to come into play, Art, and this is one uh, when I when I was writing it earlier this evening. Uh, I guess I'm listing this in as much of a chronological order as I can. Sure. I, I was reluctant to discuss this 
and the only reason I am discussing it right now is after we'd moved out and we're living where we're living now, I asked my wife if she, and I, I didn't want her to think I was nuts, so I asked her and she looked at me and said, yes, I had too, and uh, that, this is uh, the next part of the story. Um, at night in my wife and I's bedroom, which of course was my deceased mother-in-law's, at times my vision in in the dark I would I would lay awake at times and it would start to blur <sighs> eerie if not demonic type faces would appear in the dark room they would come it, it, it was it was very sharp to me and they would fade out slowly that would be enough for me and the thing that bothered me about this art was if this was my mother, it wasn't that obviously to me was not my mother-in-law. Obviously. Her appearance was not as foreboding as this particular situation. And I, I started, that's when I started thinking, my God, is, is, is there a portal or something no, else that that's followed? A, that's exactly where I was about to go. Um, we've got to wrap this up, but... That's exactly where I was going. Is, is there a clothesline to this, or is that essentially, a, did you get out of there, or what? Well, at that point, those things were starting to uh, happen at the uh, end of uh, the summer. There were thumping noises on the wall, many occasions uh, at the noon hour, almost on, on certain days. Uh, uh, frequently, the phone would ring. There would never be anybody there. And the one thing that I would like to say, Art, and this is probably of some interest to you, um, I often wonder at this point if the intrusion, taking the nothing but a appearance by my mother-in-law in, in the last few recent days to my wife, has appeared. Uh, there hasn't been anything since we moved to our new home. Mm -hmm. Well, um, but, all right. Listen, thank you so very much. There are two things here. One, it's pretty well known, and I can't explain why. Maybe you can. Maybe one of you can. Why a spirit apparently trapped on earth, or one that has not yet moved on, remains essentially in the same place, the same house, same geography, the same place. Why? Why? And the second thing that I would draw from that is, he said it himself. Do you think it might be true that once uh, something has come through, or is visible on both sides, depending on how you want to look at it, that in essence, a portal has opened, allowing not just the spirit of his mother-in-law, but more to come through. That's worth uh, some thought. On our international line, you are on the air. Good morning to you. Hi, Art. This is Mark from Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland, New Zealand. Yes, sir. Welcome to the program. Yes, yeah, so I have a bit of an unusual ghost story to tell. All right. Um, I frequently have out-of-body experiences, and uh, one time I uh, managed to catch a glimpse of my own ghost. What? What? Yes. Uh... <laughs> now, if anything would stop me from having OBEs, assuming I could have them at will, that would do it. You saw your own ghost. Yes, well, people who... Uh, frequently have out-of-body experiences will know that you can sometimes get stuck in your uh, corporeal body or physical body. This frequently happens to me and this one time um, a part of me separated while my vision remained in my body, my physical body, and um, I saw this watery... Oh my, in other words, you saw, you saw your spiritual self in a visual way, with the vision from your own body, leaving your body? Yeah, I saw it walking across the room. Well, I, I saw myself walking across the room. It was sort of a, like a third-person third perspective. <laughs> um, did that stop you from doing that? Um, no, that, that I've had um, more hair-raising experiences than that. That was, that was an unusual, though. But, uh, that hasn't stopped me. <laughs> it would have stopped me cold. All right, my friend, thank you. That's uh, from New Zealand. That would have stopped me cold. Uh, to uh, to have the physical vision remain 
in a somewhat active mind and to see your spirit leave your own body and to realize that your essentially dead spiritless body is observing its own spirit leaving no thank you east of the rockies you're on the air good morning good morning hello where are you i'm in austin austin texas all yeah. right um and so it's kind of second hand because it's something my mother told me happened before i was born it's all right what is your name sarah sarah okay sarah okay um she was living in in Salem, Massachusetts, with my father. They'd gotten married recently. Right. And in the house they were living, I think it was probably an old house, these things started happening. First, the cats started acting weird. Like, they'd be running across the room, and all of a sudden, they'd stop like there was a wall in front of them. Yes, I've seen cats do that many times. They see things we don't. Yep. And once or twice, she said she found them in shut dresser drawers. Uh... Cats? Yes. <laughs> They'd have gotten inside the drawer and it was shut behind them. Yeah. She was alone in the apartment. And once this, uh, the bathroom door was stuck, and she wasn't sure why it was stuck. She kept trying to get it open. My father wasn't home, so she had to get um, a neighbor to help her open it, and it took him a lot of work to get it open. And when they got it open, it was like 20 degrees colder in the bathroom than it had been anywhere else in the house. Really? Yes. And then... My father would start, he would, feel, he, he would say he felt a hand on the back of his neck, but my mother was across the room or in a different room and there was no one else in the house. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that happened, my mom said this was the last thing that happened and after that nothing ever happened. My father came in the room where she was and he was like all white and shaking and told her that he had been walking up the stairs and he saw this woman walking down the stairs towards him. And that she was wearing, like, old-fashioned clothes. That was all they told me. I didn't get any more detail than that. Yes. She, she was walking towards him. And then when he got when, when they passed each other on the stairs, he felt, like, totally cold all the way through. And then she vanished. And then they never saw anything else again. I sure do appreciate the story. Yeah, I thought she'd want to hear it. Oh, you're right. Thank you. I wonder what it is about the presence of an entity that causes temperatures to drop. And, by the way, I might add measurably drop. I have interviewed any number of ghost researchers, and it's about half and a half. Some say they're unable to measure the temperature to drop, but they can certainly feel it. The other half say they have measured up to, as this young lady said, up to 20 degrees and more of difference, sometimes right down to freezing. She mentioned cats and brings to mind the following. Again, from Canada, Canada must be a very haunted place. Our, where I live, we have woods by our house, about seven-tenths of a kilometer by six-tenths of a kilometer in size. And in this woods is a man some time ago who hung himself, actually 70 years ago, when his wife had died at an early age. Seventy years ago, the land that everyone is now living on was farmland. And ever since those woods have been left alone. The only thing about the man was he was a cat lover. He had about four cats. And I can tell you there is something about those woods that is pretty freaky now. Every now and then, even now, there is a gathering of cats in the woods. No lie, I've seen them. They just sit around, 10 to 20 of them. Tell you what I'll do. I'll try and get a picture of it next time it happens and send it to you. I believe the cats are gathering in this man's name. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Aloha, Art. This is Mike calling from Kihei, Maui, Hawaii. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Actually, I... I told you this briefly a few years ago. Um, my wife and I, my wife Bonnie and I, had gone over to Kauai pre-Iniki, the year before Iniki hit. Oh, the big, the big terrible hurricane, yes. That's a nasty one. We stayed at a, an older, fairly flat resort called the Coco Palms. It was nice. We had driven around the day. We went back to the hotel, pretty tired, and we went to bed. 
after listening to the little band downstairs. Sometime in the night, I woke up. I was on my back on in the bed, and something fairly large, kind of glowing, was at the foot of the bed. Bad. It was human-shaped, and it scared the bejesus out of me to the point where I was petrified and could not move. Describe it more than that. Human-shaped, uh, sort of a, a mist, you mean, or a, a... Try and do a little bit better. Well... At least seven feet tall, if it was a person, it probably would have weighed several hundred pounds. Oh, so this is very large. Like 250, 300 pounds. All right. Uh, the perception I got was that it was kind of glowing like a glow stick. You know those green glow sticks you crack at night? Yes. Okay. Well, it scared me so bad, all I did was close my eyes. Whatever it is, it's going to go away. I'm closing my eyes. That's it. Mm -hmm. Woke up in the morning. My wife and I finished our time on Kauai, went to Oahu, and driving from the airport over the poly to the, to the other side, mm -hmm. I told her on the poly, I said, you know what, babe? Last night, there was something in our room. And she turned to me. And the chicken skin started. That's when we get the, the goosebumps. So they call it in Hawaii chicken skin. She freaked out, out with her big Hawaiian eyes and looked at me and said, I saw it too. Mm. And I said, well, what would you see? Apparently she must have seen a little more than I did and or perceived more than I did. Maybe she didn't close her eyes. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> My wife says that she saw a very large Hawaiian float in through the window and stand at the foot of our bed, and it was, to her, she said, it was very pissed off. Mm. It was... A pissed off Hawaiian. A pissed off Hawaiian. Now, I'm white. My wife's almost pure Hawaiian. I'm wondering, is this a Hawaiian ghost looking down and seeing a local woman with a white man? I hear you. Angry. I hear you. That was very perturbing, and we both had chicken skin for quite some time that evening. One more recently, unfortunately, my wife's lovely father, uh, who lives over in Waimea on the Big Island, Yes. Uh, was diagnosed with a terminal cancer around May this year, and he decided that he would prefer not to fight it and would go with hospice care and prefer to live out his remaining time in the living room at home. And with a lot of the uh, homes here in Hawaii, we have day beds in the living room. No, I, I understand that. I, I think I would make the same choice. So, Shem, that's his name you know, her dad, uh, spent out his remaining time in the living room on the, on the hot, beautiful hospice bed provided. Mom lovingly cared for him, and it was wonderful because he had time and all of us family could come by and say aloha. Well, we're staying there, and he has not yet passed away, and the only room left because of all of the ohana or family over is mom and dad's room, which they really don't sleep in too much anyway because they sleep in the living room. Anyway, Dad is still alive, but getting near the end. This was in, within three days of him passing on. Mm -hmm. My wife and I go to bed about 11 o'clock at night in the parents' bed. I'm sleeping on my stomach, and something gives me a finger jab poke through the mattress into my ribs. It felt like it came up about two inches. Yes. It woke me up, scared the hell out of me, and I said, Bonnie! She goes, what? It was something poked me in the ribs. And I rolled over onto my back, and she goes, are you okay? I go, yeah, but what was that? She goes, I don't know. And then something, the pressure of someone sitting down on my legs. And I said... On your legs? On my legs. I said, and I'm getting chicken skin now. I'm freaking out remembering. I said, babe, it's sitting on my legs. What am I going to do? She says, it's okay. It's all right. It's probably just dad, his spirit, coming into the room saying, you're in our bed. I said, well, he's not dead yet. She says, I know, but 
this is his house, and he can move around when he wants. Sure. I said, Dave, can I please sleep in another room? I can't handle this. <laughs> it's too much. She said, okay. So we switched with her sister. And Dad passed on shortly after that. Uh-huh. We have not yet my, myself. She's returned to visit Mom twice. I'm a little leery about visiting. Why do you think the state of Hawaii is such a haunted state? I don't know. <laughs> it is, though. I, I've had guests on who have told story after story, like the ones you're, uh, you do, like the ones you just told. Hawaii is a very, very haunted set of islands. There's no question about it. You and your wife, well, your wife's from Oahu, right? Uh, that's correct. Thank you for listening, Art. I hope your audience <clears throat> keeps in mind that the loved ones are close by. All right. Take care, sir. Aloha. All right, that's it. Uh, tonight, all we're doing, as you can already tell, are ghost stories. Real ghost stories. And it's so easy to do. You know why? Because there are so many of them. Sorry about that. I get caught up in the stories, and it just it just happens. Um, here is a gentleman who works, or did work, actually. He did the same thing I did in a 911 dispatch center. I guess fire dispatch center. Where are you, sir? I'm in Birch Bay, Washington. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Art. Um, you're, you're about to tell me that you have had ghosts call 911? <laughs> in a way, yeah. It was basically to, um, oh, gee, it would, would be well, well over a hundred-year-old emergency, I would say, of a dying woman in a small Mexican village on the banks of the Santa Ana River. My God. A hundred-year-old emergency. Mm-hmm. Middle 1800s, 1864, to be exact. So it's a time travel story as well as a ghost story. I guess it is, huh? Well, it may be that where the spirits are, there is no time as we under- quite you know, exactly understand it or think we do. Oh, sure. And, you know, if they have a story to tell, it can wait for eternity if it has to. Well, apparently uh, one did at least part way. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how this started. Uh, I had just started at this uh, fire communication center. It was on the banks of the Santa Ana River. This was in 1984. Okay. And uh, basically it was a uh, 24-hour operation. We were on a 24-hour shift, so we would sleep and eat and pretty much live there for an entire day and then be relieved by the relief crew and uh, work that type of schedule. Uh, So normally my shift would end at 8 p.m., from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., I would get to sleep from 8 p.m. till 1 a.m. and then go back on the board till 4 in the morning. Gotcha. And we just, that way we could at least get a couple hours of uninterrupted sleep. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought the strangest thing was that none of the dispatchers would sleep in the dormitory, which struck me as really odd. They, they all seemed afraid of the place. Hmm. And you know the dispatch personality. They're usually guys that are rock-solid individuals. Oh, yes. Are not, they're pretty fearless people, basically. But uh, we have guys sleeping in the hallways or bedding down in the lounge, you know, that type of thing. Well, I'd been on for about a week, and I got woken up uh, in the morning uh, by the intercom saying that, you know, I could sleep till noon because I was going to have to work a 12-hour overtime shift. Mm. Someone had called in slip or called in sick, and I was uh, basically up for it. Well, about a half hour later, and, you know, usually these things happen when you're dead asleep, I felt something lay across my legs, and there was a groan, like somebody going, Ugh, you know, when they're stretching. Yes. And I woke up, and I saw this kind of a, um, it wasn't a mist. It was almost like a gelatinous fog breaking above my head, and the room was pitch black dark, which was really a strange thing. So anyway, I stumbled out in the dispatch center and asked the people, if, you know, what the heck was going on, and, you know, why are they playing games? And they all gave a conspiratorial look to each other and said, Nah, go back to bed. We'll tell you about the ghost later, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, so I said, real good well, after that. Yeah, right. Well, anyway, it was uneventful. I came back for the next shift, and that's when the weirdness happened. Uh, one in the morning, just a little bit before one in the morning, I, I went into the strangest dream I've ever had. I was walking along the banks of the Santa Ana River, and it felt, I mean, I knew it was 1864. I just knew it. And I thought, this is the strangest dream. Uh, for one thing, <laughs> I'm here. I'm, uh, you know, I can feel the wind on my skin. It was just barely blowing. I could hear the leaves rustling. I could feel the sand crunch underneath my feet along the banks of this river. Right. 
and I thought, wow, this is re- this is really interesting. It's, I know where I'm at. I'm right by the fire dispatch center, but the city's gone. I mean, there's nothing here, and you know, where are all the children? And the you animals? mean you were literally seeing the same geography minus the buildings and the people, except for you know differences or variations of of a river as it changes over the year. But my oh, internal my. radar and compass told me I was exactly at the fire dispatch center. I was actually walking up to it, approaching uh, northbound along the banks of the Santa Ana River. Okay. And I saw this small house. Yes. Kind of like an adobe little house, like you would see part of a ranch here or a very small village. And this woman appeared in the door. And she was, she was what you would call, oh, gee, probably a, about a 20-year-old, uh, really beautiful senorita. I mean, she was just gorgeous with long flowing hair and a smile that would melt your heart. I mean, this was like, wow, you know, what's going on? Anyway, she beckoned to me to come to the door. And as soon as my foot hit the threshold of this little house, I was kind of transported into her, if you know what I mean. It's like she melted with me, for want of a better word. Mm, Spock. We were like one person. Spock would say mind meld, yes. Almost like that, but not quite as, like, you know, as trite as you would expect something on Star Trek. This was like a total... Two bodies and two souls instantly mingling together. Wow. And it was an instant feeling of, like, warmth and love and a, a tremendous sexual rush, which uh, later on I found out that that's, that happens sometimes. Anyway, she kind of separated from me and beckoned me into the house, and I went in there, and she showed me this old woman laying on a bed. Uh-huh. And prior to entering the fire service, I'd been an ambulance driver in L.A., and you pretty much know when a person's ready to breathe their last, and this woman was definitely... She was what they call chain stoking that, uh, you know, final type of breathing. Uh-huh. And she had on a um, kind of like a floral print uh, shift dress. Yes. And this girl started to tell me that, you know, she was the last of the small village, and she had stayed there and taken care of all the people that were sick, and they had a, uh, oh, a drought and a famine, and some type of terrible disease had come through the community and killed a lot of people. And basically everybody just packed up and went up river to try to find a better place to live, took all the children and healthy people and animals, and they all just split. Makes sense, yeah. And she was the last one taking care of the last person alive that could not make the trip. Well, to make a uh, long story shorter, she basically uh, started telling me how all these people died. And this is when the dream got really bad. <laughs> I mean, it was like I was trapped in this place. If you know, well, you obviously know the, the personality of a dispatcher that's fully in control of his environment. I certainly do. I mean, you are the savior of the city. Otherwise, you'll never make it. Anyway, it was the first time in my career that I ever felt totally trapped and scared and wanting to just get up and run from the dispatch center, even though, you know, I wasn't there, but I was. Right. All these faces started coming out. They were all like Mexican villagers, which is what lived in that part of uh, California at the time. And as each face came at me, I died with them, and they were talking to me. And one after another after another, it must have been a hundred faces just coming. I mean, like, you know, literally face to face with me. And I felt the pain of their death. Uh, I take it you didn't sleep in there again. Oh, I did. (laughs) I was not going to let this, I was going to get to the bottom of what the heck was going on with this thing. Anyway... There was, the, you know, I used to hate it when one o'clock would roll along and the dispatcher's voice would come on the speaker and say, you know, get out of the sack, it's time to hit the board. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the dispatcher that was handling the shift came on and he pulled me out of my out of my sleep. Anyway, I stumbled into the communication center, didn't even put on my uniform. I was drenched in sweat. I had this big lump in my throat. These tears were just like pouring down my face. And he looked at me and said, "What in the heck happened to you?" So I told him, "I think I just got visited by a ghost." And that's when he finally said, oh, these, these darn ghosts, you know, it's like they've been banging on the switchboard all night. I've had this creepy feeling like something's standing here watching me, and I can't take this anymore. <laughs> I'm going to go sleep in the lounge. I'm not sleeping in that dorm anymore. So I figured, okay, well, you know, there is something here. It's not just me in his bed. Like something was crushing his chest. And he would talk in Spanish, and the other dispatchers would say, yeah, you know, when this guy's sleeping, he starts speaking Spanish, and that's when he's having these nightmares. Well, uh, it's obvious uh, to me, sir. Thank you very much for your call and your story. It's obvious to me what was occurring. I, too, work in a 911 dispatch center in Monterey County. And on a daily basis, even an hourly basis, you deal with life and death. Actually, I found it to be too much, and I spent a year at it and uh, 
bailed out. But you, you deal with life and death. I'm the kind of person that takes my work home with me. And so it was not the job for me. But a place of haunting? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. A place of crisis, a place where death is documented nearly on an hourly basis, sometimes more? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. On my first time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Hi there. Where are you? Paul from London, Ontario, Canada. London, Ontario. Haunted Canada. Yes, sir. Yes, and actually we are pretty haunted. Um, actually, the one I've got is from, happened when I was about eight years old. Uh, we were a bunch of us sitting around messing around, and the guys I was with decided to hold a seance. And we were sitting in my friend's basement, and... You, you decided to hold a seance? Well, yeah, you know, you're... That's, that's like, you're really inviting it. Well, yeah, that's, that's what I like. I didn't take part. I sat off in the corner going, no, I just, this isn't for me. Uh-huh. Besides, I didn't really believe in that stuff at the time. I, that, that, after that, I really changed. Um, halfway through the seance, I kept hearing strange noises, and we were sitting in his basement, and they just kept going, shh, shh, shh stop making noises. And like, well, it's not me. They're like, yeah, sure, just shut up. We're, tr we're trying to get a hold of this ghost. And all of a sudden, I, something made me look off in the corner. He had an old TV that his dad was going to throw out sitting in the corner. Well... When I looked, I noticed it started to glow. Mm -hmm. And after a few minutes, it just exploded. The, it, te the, the television exploded? Yes. The whole screen blew out. And what did it for me was the fact it was unplugged. Like it, the, the thing is, the TV was unplugged. When I looked on top of it, I saw other, other people have called in before about it, seeing the dark man. A well, dar the dark man? Yes. I saw a dark... I, I could tell it was a man. He was sitting cross-legged on the TV, wearing a long coat. He just looked at me, smiled, nodded, stood up, and disappeared. <laughs> I'd be out of there so fast. Well, the thing is, no one else saw it but me. They kept... They, they well, were, I mean, yeah, but what about the television? You said the television... Oh, they all saw the, tar they all saw the TV explode. His mom came downstairs yelling what happened, and we were just, uh, nothing. Like, I couldn't tell her, well, there was someone on top of the TV who made it blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, um, first of all, a television under no circumstance, sitting there, sedentary, uh, not plugged in. Televisions do not explode, period. Oh, I know that. Even plugged in once. That would be it for me. Well, the thing is, it, that, like... For me, I, I, you'd think you'd be scared, but I was just looking at it going, okay, that was odd. <laughs> and, I mean, since that day, I've seen the same dark man every so often out of the corner of my eye. or so, it, It's almost like he's watching. Maybe he's waiting for you. Well, that's what, that's what I think, because, like, ever since then, I've seen him, and if I don't see him, I'll hear, like, I'll hear him call my name. Yes. And the thing is, it's, it's loud and clear. Other people have heard it, and we can be in an empty hallway, and we'll hear my name clear. Maybe be... one day when he calls your name, you will go with him. Oh, that's what I thought. It, and the thing is, though, like I said, I'm not afraid of it. It's almost like he's there protecting me for something. Maybe. Maybe you should be afraid. Well, everyone says that, but I don't know... Like I said, it's just something about him doesn't seem to be scary. Uh -huh. He just seems to be there. He, he he doesn't seem to be presenting any harm to me. Uh huh. Um, I mean, you've got to consider that he's there for a reason. Oh, that I that I'm pretty sure of. I mean, that it was since that day I've started seeing other ghosts as well. So I understand. All right. Well, I I appreciate your call. Um, I. A little hesitant to suggest to you that you may be associating with somebody who who is going to uh, take you from where you are now to where you will eventually be. Wildcard line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. This is Helen in Perump. Here in Perump. Yes, sir. Excellent. <laughs> Almost neighbors, I guess. I uh, before I start my story, I uh, 
had to chuckle when I, um, I don't remember, I guess it was a, a letter you read or a fax about someone from Canada and the cat story. Oh, yes. You might want to mention to the uh, to the listeners about uh, the fire we had here last week, and they pulled out, what was it, about 104 cats that uh, were dead out of the home? I don't uh, know if you read that in the newspaper. Yes, I did. Yeah, it was pretty gruesome. Uh, pretty horrible, yes. Uh, Pahrump is a strange place in so many ways. Are you outside? Yes, I am. As a matter of fact, I'm on the porch. Not mine, I presume. <laughs> well, I'm not exactly sure where you live. No, I, <laughs> my wife says I talk loud, and I didn't want to wake the kids up. Oh, I see. So you're outside, and we're getting a little bit of wind tonight. And it looks like we're going to get some rain, huh? It sprinkled a little bit and chased me in earlier. Actually, you know, it's um, it's kind of a spooky night out here, isn't it? Yeah, it's overcast. It has been all day, but not quite this bad. All right, listen, um, I'm at a break point, so I'm going to hold you over, and since you're in Pahrump, obviously, there is no charge. Okay. So stay right where you are. We're telling ghost stories this night, and that's all we're doing. If you wish, call it Ghost to Ghost. We have a lot of documented ghost photographs. By the way, you should see the one on my website now from 1906. Here in the desert... When the clouds and the wind and the rain come, it's very eerie indeed. And here is my caller again. Out on his porch still? Yes, I am. Uh-huh. After a quick turkey break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Uh, from uh, here in Erie, Pahrump, what have you? Well, um, back in 1983, I was a young married father, and I took my wife and little baby. We moved to California to Long Beach. Um, I had a rather low-paying job, and I had an uncle that offered us an apartment in his apartment building if we managed it, so it was for free. Um, it was a little one-bedroom apartment, and we were so poor we didn't own a bed yet, so we had a fold-out couch. So we put the baby in his crib in, in the one bedroom, and we slept out on the couch until we could get in bed. Um, every night, usually about 9 or 10 o'clock, the baby would wake up just screaming, hysterical. We'd bring him out, and as soon as we brought him out, he would calm down and, and go to sleep. And it got to the point for about a month where we wound up having him sleep with us Every night, uh, we finally got a bed. <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, switched rooms. We put him out in the front room in his crib, and we slept in the bedroom. Sure. Um, I guess it was about a month or so went by. One night, I was sleeping, and I started having this weird dream that turned really scary. Now, um, as I was growing up, there was a period where, when I was a young kid, I had scary dreams all the time, and I guess out of necessity, I taught myself to wake up when the, a dream got too scary. Now, this happened to me. I woke up. Um, I was laying face down on my water bed. Mm -hmm. and something had a hand in the middle of my back mm -hmm. and had a hand on the back of my head and was shoving me down into the water, into the pillow, and I couldn't breathe. So I opened my mouth to talk to call for help to my wife, yes. and whatever was it bound my tongue. I couldn't talk. All that was coming out was a bunch of gibberish. And so I was struggling back and forth, and whatever it was was incredibly strong and shoving me down into this water bed. And I figured, well, if I wiggle back and forth enough, I'll wake my wife up. Well, she woke up, and she says, my gosh, what's going on? And she flipped on the light, and as soon as she turned on the light, um, whatever it was, released me. And she, I looked up at her, and she looked at me, and she says, oh, my gosh, what happened? I feel this. It felt, she ex described that the room felt like it was just filled with hate. And I, oh. I explained to her what had happened, and, and it was just, <laughs> you know, I didn't sleep very much that night. You know, we... Oh, thanks a lot. I've got a waterbed. <laughs> and up until now, I've loved it. Well, um, I can only imagine that. Uh, that, that was uh, attempted murder. Well... Let me finish the story, and, and, and it, it gets even creepier. I, uh, you know, we, we said a couple of quick prayers, and the room still felt creepy. We didn't sleep much that night. Um, I was also working for my uncle. So the next day I told him what had happened, and he kind of scoffed at it. He said, oh, yeah, right. I've never had anyone else complain about living in that apartment. And I said, well, I wonder what happened. And then he got kind of serious for a minute, and he goes, well, there's something I didn't want to tell you. He said, a year before you and your wife moved in, um, we had um, a couple that lived there, and the man was this was a drug dealer, and he wound up getting murdered in that room. Somebody came in and busted in and shot him with a shotgun. <laughs> and I said, and you're trying to tell me you don't believe, you know, what I'm telling you, that you think it's just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. And he really didn't say much after that. And uh, that's basically my story. Up until then, of course, I never believed in ghosts. And that's after that, I've been... <laughs> that's enough for me, sir. I've been converted. I, I appreciate the call on the dark, rainy night. You bet. Take care. That was attempted murder. That was attempted murder. Can you imagine having that happen to you? 
a presence that you can't possibly fight pressing you down into the bed, pressing your tongue so you cannot speak, your head, your back into the bed. No, thank you. Um, good morning. You're on Ghost to Ghost AM. I'm Mark Bell. Where are you, please? Uh, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Yeah, I'm listening to you on your net. Okay. Um, my story uh, goes back to when I joined the Navy. Uh, well, I, I joined in 1980 as a nuclear power electrician and got assigned to the USS Enterprise in 1982. Oh, the Enterprise. Right. And um, the biggest nuclear power carrier in the world, she will not fit through the Panama Canal. She has to go all the way around. I believe that. I went through the Panama Canal myself on a, uh, uh, on a, on a large uh, you know, cruise liner. And as we went through, we scraped the sides of the <laughs> ship, so it was that close. Well, um, it, it has to do with the uh, uh, ghosts that have been there for uh, quite some time. They've been there for a very long time. Um, the refit took three years before I even got to the ship. They took the superstructure off, put a new one on, and I was just getting to the boat as she came out of uh, her refit. And so uh, these guys who assigned watches uh, were telling me, uh, do you want a mid-watch and five and six switch gear? And I said, I don't know. And I said, well, you know, there's a ghost. Well, I'm not a right. Navy guy. Five and six switch gear, what's that? Um, that's where the um, uh, five and six switch gear is where the uh, controls for the ship service term generators are ah. for paralleling and taking up and down. Generators, okay. Okay. And... Um, so I, I didn't really much believe him, and he gave me a, a mid-watch. And I stood a mid-watch on five and six switch gear and uh, heard somebody roaming around in the, in the back room because what we had in one of that one switch gear, we had our, our little office where we had our morning meetings and we had our, you know, gear pullers and our electrical equipment in there. And it sounded like someone opening, closing drawers, and moving around. Mm. And I walk in there, and there's only one way in and out, one door. And you can see it from the switchgear where you're at. And I open the door, and there's nobody in there. And, you know, I thought, well, maybe somebody's messing with me, but there was never anybody in that switchgear. And th then I come to find out there was another ghost haunting number two and three switchgear. And, by the way, if there's any listeners who were on the Enterprise, who were in EE30, Electrical Engineering Group 30, they can verify this. Um, and two and three switch gear, there was also a ghost. Now, from what I was told, these guys who were haunting had uh, been vaporized by opening disconnects when they were fully energized. And yeah. what that had done is it drew an arc and created a fireball and vaporized him and the switch gear around him. It just vaporized everything it touched. And so these people were instantly turned into uh, gas. Yeah, cinder. Right. And um, the one and two and three switch gear was uh, more prevalent. Um, one guy told me, he says, uh, yeah, you can't sleep in two and three switch gear because uh, he'll keep you awake. This, and, uh, yeah, this is very common. You know, when people die that way, completely, unexpectedly, instantly, tragically, that's when they seem to remain. And the thing was, he, he, he was, he was like a, a guardian, you know what I mean? He was making sure that the guys didn't fall asleep on watch, because he'd do something to you. Now, I, I was just, you know, I was wondering about the one, two, and three, because I hadn't ever seen it, so I decided to play a trick. And I decided to, to pretend I was nodding off. And it felt like someone grabbed the back of my head, my hair, and yanked my head, and jerked it to wake me up <laughs> and I was like man <laughs> and that that did that that just you know sends a shiver up your spine I take it you stayed awake on future watch <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, it was really really something and, um, and you, you're telling me that anybody who was on the enterprise EE30 that time could verify this oh yes oh yes guarantee it guarantee it there's there's absolutely no doubt in fact one guy left his post screaming from two and three switch gear and said he'd never stand watch there again, ever. And he never told anybody what happened. 
and and he wasn't in electrical engineering group theory. He was uh, a, a conventional electrician. Sometimes really good at conventional electricians, they'd let Stan watch um, on those switch gears. But the, see, the thing was, is there was the there was the nuclear electricians, and there was the EE thirty. What what kind of voltage and current were running through those? Four fifty. Four hundred and fifty. Right. Um, and I tremendous can't current the ratings of those generators. Uh, tremendous, I'm sure. Um, we had eight turbine generators in all, and there were four uh, react. Or there were four main machinery rooms and two reactors for each. So we had a total of eight reactors, and each reactor, I believe, was one megawatt each. So we were running about eight megawatts of power when we were churning and burning. Whew. I appreciate. Uh... I'm sure you were glad to get off the Enterprise. Well, you know what? I I, I never really had a problem with them. Uh, it didn't it didn't really scare me. Uh, was there any doubt about the fact? Now you say you tried to you sort of pretended to be asleep. Yeah, I was trying to see if it was real. Do you think that it could have been your imagination? Oh no, oh no. When someone comes up to you and grabs your hair and jerks your head, you know it. You're right. You know it. I mean that that's something and. It, it 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 happened to every anybody who ever fell asleep in two and three switch gear, boom, they get waking up instantly. You could uh, never never fall asleep on there I while you were on watch. Appreciate your call, sir. Yep. Thank you. Take care. He's right. There would be no mistaking somebody grabbing your hair and yanking your head up. Would there? First time caller line. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bell. How are you? I'm sorry. I said, how are you? Uh, pretty good. And yourself? Fine. Where are you? I'm calling uh, from southern Indiana. Southern Indiana. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to answer your questions first. Uh, you had a couple, like, uh, why do ghosts stay in one place? And uh, uh, I think there was something right up about uh, uh, why does the temperature change when there are uh, ghosts around? Well, I think the last caller was a very good example of a ghost that remained uh, exactly there. And if, if that one didn't do it for you, I've got one from San Antonio, Texas, that'll curl your hair. That was uh, that was uh, fairly scary, but uh, I was wanting to explain to you why ghosts stay there. Though. Now, uh, I was speaking from uh, the philosophical point of a uh, ceremonial magician. I don't know if you know anything about like ceremonial magic or uh, Kabbalah or uh, ritual magic or anything like that. I know a little bit about it. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the philosophical elements like earth, air, fire, and water? I am. Well, they have spirits associated with those their uh intelligence of sorts that are that are similar to animals uh, as far as their intellectual level mm -hmm. but uh sometimes uh see elementals can feed off of emotional energy that people put out that's right and when people pass away uh they'll leave uh their astral shell or astral body behind and sometimes these elementals can can take control of these astral shells and uh they'll present themselves as a ghost when in fact, uh, they're elementals, but they'll, they'll take on this form. And uh, like, for example, a deceased father or a mother or something, and uh, when this person feels an emotional uh, attachment to this image they see, that elemental can draw energy from that individual. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one reason why uh, ghosts stay around like that. Uh, so in other words, they... They produce uh, the, one of the greatest emotions a human can have, mortal fear, and then feed from it. Yeah, fear, love, any kind of emotion, anger, uh, hate, uh, anything, elementals can uh, feed from that. Not all elementals will do that, though. That, that has to be something that's, that's learned from them, uh, kind of trained. Like I said, they have like the intelligence of animals. So. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that also has to do with the, the temperature change. The temperature change in the room, because, for example, like uh, a water elemental could produce a, a cool temperature in a room. But uh, why would a spirit be bound, like the spirit on the Enterprise or the spirits, to, well, in effect, stand uh, stand guard? Now, I'm going to tell you a very quick story, very much like it. I think a lot of the audience may have heard this, or perhaps not, but it is a true story. Believe it. In San Antonio, Texas, a school bus full of children stalled on a train track. A train hit it broadside, killed 
all the children uh, or the majority of the children on the bus. A horrible tragedy in the San Antonio area. And ever since, at that particular intersection, if a car stalls, uh, in fact, people go and test it. They actually take their car and they drive onto these train tracks and stop and put the car in neutral. And the car is always pushed um, or seemingly moves by itself off the tracks and onto the road on the other side into safety. Now, they have tested this. They, they have taken cars and put them on the tracks with talcum powder on the back of the car. Actually, I, I have heard of this, Mr. Bill. This true story. And when the car reaches the other side of the tracks, there are children's handprints to be found in the talcum powder. And this, this can be done repeatedly. It'll occur again and again and again. And the story from the Enterprise reminded me of that. See, uh, something like that would... Uh may work on the same lines uh, that a, a talisman may work. Now, a talisman, I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, how talisman, talismans operate, but what a talisman is created, it creates a, a vortex of energy that draws things to it. So like if you create a talisman to, say, uh, bring money into your life or love or whatever else you bring, you make the talisman for, it creates a magnetic attraction to that. Uh, now, it's curious that there are several people involved in the in the accident, when there were quite a few people together, and an accident like this occurs, there's a great amount of fear for a split instant before they're they're killed. Uh, that goes through their minds. Now this is this would be imprinted on the the material that was around them at the time, so that that could work very similar. It could create a imprinted on the material. Yeah, like for example, uh, the uh, the land around it, the specific uh, area where the accident happened, the railroad tracks. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, iron is a very good uh, conductor for etheric energies like that. Let me tell you a little story because we're out of time, uh, but the, you mentioned it. Scientists are now believing that material things, wood, glass, crystal, in fact, most material objects carry memories and scientists are actually getting to the point where they can extract these memories kind of like a video show kind of like the uh, if that motel bed could tell a story <laughs> but I'm very serious about that material things that soon may be able to uh, relate what has happened around them Here we go, uh, and I think we're going down to San Diego, California, and we're going to hear from a police officer named uh, Steve. Steve, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. It was a dark and stormy night. Uh, yes, uh, the bad weather, um, the eerie weather is sweeping up through your state toward us uh, very quickly indeed. Steve, you um, are a member of uh, San Diego PD? Yes, I am. Twelve years. Twelve years? Yeah. How long ago did this occur? This actually happened uh, about 12 years ago. I was uh, just out of just out of the academy, and I was assigned to a field training officer, and we go through a couple phases of that. And uh, I was working in the southeast area of San Diego, which at that time was a pretty high activity area, a lot of crime. Mm. And uh, the guy I got assigned with had been on almost 30 years, and was pretty much the classic grizzled and and beaten veteran. So it's yeah. kind of like the rookie in the old war. Yeah, <laughs> basically the new blood and the, uh, the crusty old guy. And uh, we were driving down uh, one of the boulevards down at about 3 in the morning, and as we approached the intersection in a, in a residential area, we saw a, a male standing on the corner, and as we passed him, he appeared to be bleeding profusely from the head and from the face, and just looked like he'd just been stabbed several times. And uh, as we passed by, we both looked at each other and said, hey, did you see that? And I said, yeah. And, and I was driving at the time. I, I flipped the car around real quick and drove back, and we both got out of the car, and, and we couldn't find him. He was, he was gone. And, and this, was, this happened over a period of probably maybe three to five seconds in the time it took me to put on the brakes and, and spin the car around and drive back. And, and he was gone that fast. He was gone that fast. And we got out of the car, and we checked up and down the street, and... Uh, there was no blood trails. There was absolutely nothing that ever indicated he was there. 
And uh, we got back in the car, and we sat there quietly for a moment, and we looked at each other, and we asked each other again. We said, hey, you know, did you did you see this guy? I mean, he had to have been there, right? And we both confirmed that we both saw him, and uh, we pretty much decided not to tell anybody after that. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I was pretty con- uh, pretty convinced that that's what we saw. We were thinking maybe it was a, a recent murder victim or something that may have, may have again been restless or something. And uh, Did you uh, write a report up? Oh no no <laughs> no no we just uh, you know we just talked about it with each other and and uh, yeah I don't I don't think uh, we let it go out of the car at that time mm-hmm. it was just uh, from that point on it really was uh, something that I thought about occasionally and and convinced me that certainly there's something out there that uh, we're just uh, not aware of. Boy, do I appreciate the story, Steve. Yeah, you betcha. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Good night. Take care. San Diego police officer. Convince me there's something out there. That's right. There is something out there. Now, something we don't understand, we may never understand, but it's it, you can be sure it's out there. As I keep saying, there are probably as many stories out there as there are all of you. And... And you don't really get them until you invite them. And you've got to invite them in a certain way. You can't invite them and ridicule them. You can only invite people to share uh, once they become aware that others have seen uh, some of the same things that they have seen. And then the outpouring is hard to stop. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. This is Mike from Sacramento. Hello, Mike. How are you? Um, my story starts, I'm a stuntman. And I do a lot of traveling around the country, and I was in Coral Gable, Florida. And there's a big hotel there called the Coral Gable that used to be Al Capone's, like, hangout. Mm. And so I went down there to do a film with a couple of buddies of mine. And um, as I walked into the hotel, it's this huge palatial uh, hotel that, uh, you know, like a huge mansion. Was it a movie I would remember? Um, Bad Boys. Bad Boys. With uh, Will Smith. I think I do recall that, yes. Yeah. I've been a lot of films, and I've come across a lot of ghosts too. But this one was the scariest one that's ever happened to me. And so I walked through the door, and I was with my friend Richard, and I turned to him and I said, "This place is haunted, man. This place is haunted." He said, "I said, did you feel that when I walked through the door? It's like a cold wind." Now this place is huge. It's not little. It's massive. And so uh, we got assigned to our room, and I was the only stuntman that was on the fifth floor. And so I went to bed early because I had an early call that morning. And so around 11:30, um, I hear a knock at my door. I get up look out and there's nobody there and I don't know one of the guys is telling a joke on me right so I lay back down start to go to sleep and I start feeling my covers being pulled off me right? <laughs> and I said come on and I look down and I thought someone snuck in right so okay whatever knock at the door again go to the door nobody's there now I'm getting kind of irritated and I'm hearing like a party going on down the hallway and it's like noise I'm trying to get to sleep I got, I got a 4.30 call I'm getting real agitated so I lay back down again, cover myself up, the cover start pulling off me again, and I'm saying, someone's short sheet me or something here, right? Right. I get up, door knocks again, open up, and there's a guy at the end of the hallway wearing a tuxedo and a red uh, carnation with his hair slicked back. And he looks kind of odd because it looks like a period, like a period suit. Yes, like sir. Like a 1920 period. Yes, sir. And I looked at the guy and I said, hey, bud, you know, I'm trying to get some sleep. i got to go to work tomorrow. Could you just knock it off? It's not funny. And he kind of laughed and turned and walked down the hallway. So I shut my door, and all night long, party, party. I called downstairs, and I said, look, you know what? I'm going to have to change rooms. This floor is way too noisy. And she says, oh, you're on the fifth floor. I went, yeah. And she says, okay. So I hang up, go to sleep, and I didn't sleep much that night. And I get up the next morning, and I go down to the lobby, and there's a historical society booth right there. Yes. And I said, uh, excuse me, I said, is this place haunted? And she started laughing. She says, oh, this is one of the most haunted places in North America. I'm going, oh, thanks. I said, she says, you weren't staying on the fifth floor, were you? I said, yeah. She said, well, that was where the morgue used to be during World War II. It was converted into a hospital, and that was the morgue. Oh, my. And I went, well, great. So immediately I went to the front desk and I said, I'd like to be moved off the fifth floor. That's what I would have done. It was pretty, and even talking about it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Can I tell you one more quick, quick story? Very quickly, yes. Okay, I was at uh, Rosemary Clooney's house. And uh, used to, the house used to belong to Russ Colombo. And Russ Colombo was a crooner during the, like, the 20s. He's like kind of a predecessor to uh, Bing Crosby. Yes, sir. 
And so I went into their bathroom. I didn't know their house was haunted at the time. I went into their bathroom, and I started going to the bathroom. And some guy behind me goes, hey, buddy, what do you think you're doing? And I jumped literally out of the bathroom, zipping myself up and running into the front room going, oh, my God, there's a guy in the bathroom. <laughs> you're probably not needing the bathroom. No, no, no. That, that was like, I was like, hey, I don't, my <laughs> friend uh, Miguel, who, who's Rosemary's son, uh, started laughing. He goes, oh, that was Russ Colombo. He goes, uh, he's always playing tricks in the house. He's been dead. He got shot in the head here. Whew. So uh, you, you, wow, oh my, shot in the head. Yeah, you got, if I accident, it was one of those uh, fake cannons that you know you like, you buy through mail order or whatever, and someone had put a BB and our marble inside it, and when it was set off, it ricocheted around the room and hit him in the head. All right, I appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Wild card line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Hi there. Where are you? Uh, Houston, Texas. Houston, all right, yes. you're going to have to yell at us a little, you're not too loud. Oh, okay. Well, my name is Mary. I'm originally from Houston, but I lived in Georgia, a small town in Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, called Covington, Georgia, a very historical little town. Beautiful area, old uh, southern mansion-type homes. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Yeah, well, I lived behind the mansion in a garage apartment overlooking the cemetery mm -hmm. on Elm Street. And when we moved into the apartment, my brother-in-law was kidding me about it, saying I would never be alone. Okay? Yeah. Well, I figured, you know, it's because of the cemetery. Well, one night, my husband, he worked out of town, and he would only come in on the weekend. So I was there by myself all the time, which is kind of spooky anyway. But I'm not, you know, prone to uh, let my imagination run wild with me. Well, early in 1975, I was at the house. Uh, the apartment, all by myself. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm shaking just thinking about it. <laughs> and I had the TV on, and it started acting funny and was picking up um, Houston, Texas. You know, ads. <laughs> really? Houston. Right. Okay, the apartment, I could not get it to stay warm. And I was just restless that night and just wandering back and forth between the bedroom and the living room. And at the top of the landing, it was 13 steps down to the to the front door. Naturally. And it had a little window. Mm -hmm. Okay, in this little window, I saw, like, a face. Okay? And I kept hearing this humming. I kept turning off the TV and everything and listening, and I heard this humming. Now, it wasn't like a... Uh, like a heater humming, you know, the air or anything like that. It was mm -hmm. actually very cold. So I was nervous. I stayed up all night. I could not sleep. I kept hearing this humming, but it wasn't like a mechanical humming or anything like that, or electronic. It was like a, a voice humming. Okay. So being I was up all night and everything, I decided the next morning I would take a walk. So I walked out there, and I was looking at all the old Confederate... Um, tombstones, everything, all the unwatched graves, you know, oh, yes. the cross on it and everything. And when I came back over to the apartment, uh, there's one little sectioned area there with wrought iron and everything, and it had about six tombstones in it, so I walked around it and I'm looking. This was so freaky. There was a young lady whose tombstone was there. She died back in, I believe it was 1873. Mm -hmm. Her name was Mary Robbins. She died when she was 16 years old. My maiden name was Robin. Oh. Needless to say, we moved. <laughs> you got out of there. <laughs> yeah, it was just too strange, too frightening. I must say, um, the graveyards are very strange places. I mean, they really are very strange places. Well, they are quiet neighbors. But that night... The quiet neighbors? Um, <laughs> no, you can feel them. Uh, I, I thank you very much. I've got a little story for you. My wife and I love Paris, France. You know, City of Lights. We go back there and we'll go back again. Paris is a, a magical town. Whatever you may say about the French, and there's a lot you can say about the French, Paris itself is just... Uh, uh, there, there, there is no city like Paris. Very romantic town. In our last visit to Paris, uh, we decided to travel about, oh, I don't know, 20 miles outside the center of the city 
and visit the burial place of Jim Morrison. It was a very, very, very large cemetery, and we had a very difficult time finding the burial place of Jim Morrison. And I finally got sick of looking, and there were tombs everywhere, and they were truly ancient uh, back in 1800s, uh, late 1700s. It was creepy. I mean, they were all around you. Uh, you were literally in a field of graves. Many of them uh, decrepit. Many of them, the, ins uh, the inscriptions, very difficult to read. And I, I finally got sick of looking, and so I said, I'm just going to sit here and wait. And Ramona would uh, hike up the hill and look for Jim Morrison's resting place. But just sitting there by myself, in the middle of all these very old stone graves, I don't want to tell you because I, I, I would be lying that I, I could feel a presence. Because I didn't. I felt a kind of universal presence, a kind of reverence that I can't quite explain for uh, a place where many, many lives um, came to rest. So no ghost story there, just a, a very eerie feeling. We did uh, incidentally find uh, the resting place of Jim Morrison, ultimately. But sitting there by myself, with all of these crypts, many of them crypts around me. Very odd feeling. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Well, hello. Good morning, Art. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. You're going to have to kind of yell at us a little. Uh, this is Dave from northern New Jersey. Yes, sir. About 40 miles west of New York City. Okay. A lot of people out here love you. Thank you. And we're tired of the Art Bell bashing from the local affiliate. Oh, you, you, you refer not to the local affiliate, but to Curtis Sliwa. Correct. And his little angels, his band of angels. They're supposedly coming out here to uh, talk to me. He talked about it for the whole past uh, week and a half. Yeah, that's what I've heard. In any event. He ruins my NFL Sunday, and they'll be hell to pay, I'll tell you that right <laughs> now. Any, anyway, do you have a story? I've got a wonderful one. All right. Uh, it's a little bit long. I'll try to condense it for you. I got my parents a puppy back in 1980 because my dad had recently lost his hearing. And I had read that it was very cathartic to healing to get an animal for a person that went through a traumatic loss of the sense. It absolutely is. It lowers blood pressure. Right. Uh, scientifically uh, proven again and again. Listen, uh, it's going to take obviously a moment for this uh, story to unwind. So let me go ahead and do the break and come back and we'll... We'll get it full on, all right? Okay. Okay, stay right there. Yes. Yes, if uh, Curtis and his little band of so-called angels come out and screw with my NFL Sunday, they're going to be haunting the halls of WABC. You hear me, Curtis? From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. Uh, back now, I think, to New Jersey, right? Uh, with Dave, right. Right, Dave. Okay, now go right ahead. Okay, I got the puppy from my dad back in 1980. Uh, it was a highly evolved little animal, a Cairn Terrier, mm -hmm. kind of like Toto. There are some uh, dogs and cats that are more evolved than others. Yeah, she was definitely a unique animal. Mm-hmm. And even though I didn't live with my mom and dad, she was my dog, which is kind of weird. No, anyway, it, no, no, not really. That ha it happens. In uh, in October of 1991, she developed a lump on her back that got bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh. We took her to the vet. Turned out she had an inoperable type of cancer called fibrosis sarcoma, mm -hmm. with a one to three percent cure rate. Right. Which is like a death sentence. Right. So I didn't want to accept that, and I must have taken her to eight or nine vets throughout the state of New Jersey, and my friends thought I was crazy, you know, getting obsessed, being obsessed, whatever. No, I understand. Anyway, to make a long story short, I finally got networked in with a veterinary oncologist down in Red Bank, Central Jersey. 
Mm-hmm. And he was affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary College, a teaching college. And he had just heard of a new interferon-based drug that had been approved by the Department of Agriculture, which is the government arm for drugs for animals as the FDA is for people. Sure. And he gave her the treatments, and she was cancer-free within three months. The tumor receded. It receded, and it, it just kind of popped off, and it was like a kind of bowl of jelly on her back, and they operated, and it was gone, and there was no trace. Wow. And she made the front page of the Esbury Park Press, which is the main paper for central New Jersey, with a readership of about a million two. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she finally got cancer back again in uh, August of 1993. Yes, sir. So it extended her life about two and a half years, approximately. And we've had, we had to make the decision to get her euthanized. Right. Even though we didn't want to. Right. But it was for her best interest. And it's tough when you lose some, something you love. And I felt very, very close to her. It's very hard. And I prayed. And I prayed. And this is down at my mom and dad's, about 80 miles south of where I live. And I asked God if God would please give me a sign to let me know that she was okay. Hmm. Now, I just have to interject one thing in here. When she was a younger dog and healthy, because she was a little dog, I used to have this little game with her where I'd pick her up, kind of rock her back and forth, and gently, like, throw her on the bed. Sure. And she would land with, like, a boom, you know, passing on the bed. Right. Wagging her tail and waiting for me to pick her up to do it again. Right. So I get back home the following morning, you know, after we had her euthanized, got back to my apartment, the middle of a beautiful August day, and uh, I'm sitting on my bed, and I think this happened during the day purposely so it wouldn't frighten me. And if, if somebody had told me this, Art, I would have a very tough time believing it if it didn't happen to me. Sitting on my bed, all of a sudden, I hear a thump to my left, and I instantly turn. Right. And as God is my witness, there are four indentations of, of like paw prints on my bed, right into the mattress. It was not of this earth. Oof. And at that point, I got a chill, and I'm getting a chill right now. But it made me believe that there really is something after in respect to the fact that this happened because I prayed for it and I felt incredibly lucky that God heard me and God answered me. I believe every word of it, every single word of it. And it was the most incredible thing that ever happened to me in my life, you know, to this day. I really appreciate your telling the story. And I thank you, sir. Thank you, Art. I uh, had a cat. You know, I'm a big cat person. And I had a cat named Yesu. I named him Yesu after uh, after the Yesu Radio Company. They make ham gear, you know, so I thought it was cute to name a cat Yesu. And Yesu was 20 pounds plus. Yesu was a big black cat. And Yesu was an outside cat. I, I now don't let cats outside, but Yesu was an outside cat. He was a he was a macho sob. I'll tell you, I got into, I, I, there were a couple times I actually got into fights with Yesu, but most times we loved each other. And uh, somebody shot Yesu, and I didn't realize it. And I, but I did realize that my cat was extremely ill, possibly dying. And uh, unfortunately, the bullet hole um, was not visible. Uh, somehow, the bullet had gone in and exited and gone right through Yesu's body and wasn't visible. You know, the fur, I guess the blood clotted, I don't know, the fur covered it. I had no idea this cat had been shot. Yesu, uh, to make a long story short, died in my arms. That's something I will never forget, just died in my arms. Where are you, please? I am in uh, beautiful downtown Monticello, Minnesota. Yes, sir. 
uh, just north of the uh, Twin Cities and listening to you on uh, KSTP AM 1500. I suspect KSTP goes all the way to the North Pole. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. Yes. Yeah. So. I am um, with a partner, do a lot of uh, work with ghosts in the Twin City area, and uh, we've had uh, several... You mean you do this professionally? I would say semi-professionally because it's not uh, constant enough to be professional by any means. All right. Um, uh, you know, it's occasional once, once um, every month or two you get the, somebody says, help me. <laughs> but um, we did have a um, very interesting encounter um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was my, my brush with fame. And uh, the most famous person I can say that I've uh, had a long conversation with would, in fact, be the late, great John Dillinger. I beg your pardon? Uh, that would, that in fact, would be it. Uh, John Dillinger, uh, public enemy number one. You spoke with John Dillinger? Or an entity claiming to be such. How, uh, please explain the circumstances. Okay, okay. Um, let me go back a little bit. And uh, as with the work I do, I uh, don't like to use the term seance. It's a very superstitious term, has a lot of negative connotations. Yes. I prefer the more enlightened term of uh, circular gathering for communication with immortality impaired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let me get that straight. Circular gathering for communication with the mortality impaired? That is it. Uh, I've got to remember that one, all right. But um, we decided uh, about a year and a half ago <laughs> to, um, a group of us have a strong interest in uh, 1930s gangsters. And so we decided to have one of these circular gatherings to uh, talk to Mr. Dillinger on the anniversary of his death, which was uh, July 22nd. Uh-huh. And so the first half of the evening, we uh, invite uh, whatever entities want to come to us. It's like kind of a warm-up. And uh, we spoke to several different entities at that, during that time period. Aren't and you afraid to do that? Aren't you afraid to open a door, a door which uh, you have no idea well, we take, what's we going take, to walk through? We take precautions. Mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of work to protect ourselves. Uh, we call on higher powers. And uh, whatever your faith system, be that God, angels, mm -hmm. we do call on their assistance. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be foolish about this. <laughs> um, I would, I have a healthy respect for these things. Um, and uh, being interested in documenting this uh, occurrence, we did have tape recorders on hand, and because uh, sometimes you can get something known as electronic voice phenomena, which is basically recordings of ghost voices. You bet. And, you know, that was the ultimate hope, but at least just to kind of document what happened that night. Um, the first half of the uh, of the evening, we spoke to several different entities, um, and we did uh, have the recorder in operation, and the um, played back that first half of the tape. And we don't get any EVP, but we do get, you know, at least the room noise and the, P and the human side of the conversation. Take a short break, and... Uh, after that short break, we uh, call on Mr. Dillinger, and about five, ten seconds after we begin our, our work, something enters the room claiming to be John Dillinger. We speak to him for about a half hour, 45 minutes. Now, when you say you speak to him, uh, via Ouija board? Uh, no, no, no. I, I. You mean aloud? Aloud, and um, we get basically psychic impressions back. Um, Ouija boards... I, I kind of have a very strong feeling about Ouija boards. So do I. Um, they can be a useful tool, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit spiritually like uh, opening your door and inviting the first person that passes by on the street to come in. That's right. You just don't know what you're going to get. Um, so, we, you know, we were speaking to this, this entity, and uh, it answered a lot of questions. Um, we, you know, we know a little bit about Dillinger and had some specific questions uh, like the fate of uh, some of his uh, gang members. And uh, at the end of the evening, we played that tape back, and about five to ten seconds after we begin the uh, the work, the tape goes completely blank. Not even the human side of the conversation, yet most of the people at the table could see that the tape recorder was in operation. Okay... I'm curious, uh, with all the work you did, you must have some recordings, some interesting recordings. Have you, have you kept them? 
you know, I've kept them. I have yet to come up uh, for any of our, our works where we contact anything or uh, cleanse a house. We have yet to come up with any decent EVPs, although I have not had really good recording equipment there. It's usually uh, pocket recorders. And, um, what was it that Dillinger said to you? Um, well, we, uh, we had quite a, bit of, quite a few questions for him. Uh, one of the more interesting things was uh, one of his gang members, uh, Red Hamilton, was uh, supposedly shot in the back in a chase from Hastings, Minnesota to St. Paul, Minnesota, mm -hmm. and died several days thereafter. There had been rumors that uh, Red Hamilton indeed did not get killed and made it out alive and uh, hit undercover, much like the rumors about Butch Cassidy. But uh, we asked John Dillinger about that, and uh, he said, well, yeah, of course, Red got it out. He, he was fine. He lived to a ripe old age. What was interesting about that is three or four people at the table did get the distinct impression that at that point we were definitely being lied to. And some of them even went so far as to suspect that uh, maybe John Dillinger killed the guys to speed the death along so he could uh, run further faster. <laughs> well, what would you expect from John Dillinger? Yeah, well, I mean, he's... He got a reputation as, as a cold-blooded guy, and then uh, there were some apologists recently saying, uh, well, no, he wasn't so bad, but uh, maybe he was. <laughs> maybe he was. I sure appreciate the story, sir. Okay. Thank you, and uh, take care. Hello, Art. Having just heard the story from your fellow townsperson, or Perumbian, if you will, I thought I would multiply the impact of that story. About 15 years ago, while sleeping in my upstate New York, very old residence, I was aroused by the growling of my husky shepherd, but I could not awaken. I was paralyzed, unable to move or speak. The absolute sensation of a person kneeling on my chest and restraining me delivered one of the most solid moments of panic I've ever known. I was, I assure you, totally conscious, but powerless to move my limbs or cry out as the weight of this apparition, apparition rather, seemed to increase. The entire time my dog kept barking and growling. I concentrated on the sound of his voice until I was suddenly able to sit up and force the intruder off my chest. Within a heartbeat to my utter amazement, the curtains of my room were shoved aside. Even though the window was closed, my dog confirmed what I had seen by leaping to the window and continuing the barking and growling. It took a full 30 minutes before my dog would come and sit with me on the bed. And there was no more sleep to be had that night, and I stayed with friends for a few nights following that incident. Yeah, I really love hearing stories about Pahrump. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, Hart, hi. Hi. Uh, some funny stories tonight. And um, I'm, by the way, my name is Dan. I'm calling from uh, Woodland Hills, California. Yes, sir. Um, i got another terrifying story to share with you. Fire it actually, Yeah, it actually happened to my father back in 1961 uh, down in Dana Point, California. And um, like I said, it is rather terrifying. He was coming home late one night from work. Um, and uh, the house he was living in had partially burned down, so he was back in an add-on home in the back. Um, he was getting ready for, for bed, and uh, like I said, this is 61, and there were some um, some of those rather kind of deco lamps hanging up in there that had the strings that you pull to turn them on. Oh, yes. Uh, it, you, might, you might remember. Sure, <laughs> I do. But uh, anyway, he um, had just gotten ready for bed and turned the lights off, and the lights were controlled from a switch on the wall. Right. And uh, so he didn't turn them off from the, the pole. He just did them from the switch. Well, he laid down to go to bed, and um, uh, the, the room was completely sealed, and the mattress he was laying on was rather low to the floor. It didn't have one of those box springs. Right. Well, he laid there uh, just for about a minute or two trying to get to sleep, and as I said, uh, the whole room was sealed shut. He started to notice and actually hear these strings for the lights uh, jingling, just jing, 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 jing. And uh, he started getting you know, wondering what that was. And he was just looking straight up at the rafters on the ceiling. And at that moment, he, uh, it still frightens me today to, to talk about this, he heard a, um, 
actually just didn't hear, but he felt a moan and a breath blow into his ear like a, oh, like this. Oh, boy. And uh, um, this is the kind of stuff that you hear about, but uh, my father's a very serious man, and he's never had experiences like this before. And, um, it really affected me. So he was laying there, and, of course, as I've been hearing this evening, he was just completely petrified. Um, but he heard this, the, the thing still rattling, uh, as if there was some kind of motion in the room, and this thing did it again, moaned into his ear louder and longer. Well, you, you go uh, into a kind of a state of shock is what happens. I guess it is. I guess the system goes into a, a complete shock. But he definitely had a sense. Um, this happened a third time, and this happened over um, probably, probably was seemed, uh, it's pretty for him, but he said it was just a couple of minutes. Um, he definitely had a sense beyond the shock that he had to, he had to move. He was in utter um, danger uh, for right. whatever reason. Um, I don't know if it was right. possession or, or, or what. It's fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, uh, so he, he was there, but like I said, he was overcome even over that with, with, with a sense to, to get out of there. So he summoned every ounce of courage he had, and he jumped out of bed, ran across the room, flipped the light switch on, looked back, and, of course, there was nothing there. Uh, but the things were still moving up there. Well, needless to say, he got out of there and never slept in that room again. I wouldn't. But it's, uh, it's affected me so much that uh, I, I actually cover my ears when I sleep at night because of that story. <laughs> For me, it's closets. I never go to sleep with an open closet. <laughs> there are things in closets. You always close closets before you go to sleep if you're smart. If you don't want things coming out of them, you close them. Amen. Thank you for the call, sir. Sure. All right, we're going to break here at the top of the hour. There is more. If you can handle it, if your heart can handle it, there is more. This is what we call Ghost to Ghost AM, and I do it when I get in the mood, and this is one of those nights. It's dark, it's kind of windy, and a little bit of rain in the air in the desert. It's kind of eerie. It's a good night for this. I'm Art Bell, and this is Ghost to Ghost AM. <laughs> Here we go again. Uh, first time caller line. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. How are you and where are you? I'm fine. Uh, I'm Derek. I'm calling from Metairie, Louisiana, which is right next door to New Orleans. Uh, which is also the home of Anne Rice. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and she gets lots of, uh, lots of attention around here. Sure. We've got a, a nice spooky night, uh, down here too. It's extremely foggy right now, so. Well, look, you live in an area. Fog or not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It feels like you're swimming no matter what time. It is. Right. But anyway, about 10 years ago, uh, around 1988, uh, me and my girlfriend and my girlfriend's friend, ex-girlfriend, these are all ex, but me and my ex-girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend's friend, my ex-girlfriend's younger sister, and my ex-girlfriend's younger sister's friend were all together one night. It was a Friday night, mm -hmm. and we were looking for something to do. So we said, hey. Uh, let's try a Ouija board. What's that? You know, and I, I really wish that I would have known what your earlier caller said about you never know what you're going to get into because we really didn't. And uh, I, being the you know scientifically minded, decided to to do it in a way that you know it couldn't be faked. You know, I just wanted to make sure that all the bases were covered and that uh, whatever happened would really happen. You know. Yes, I so, have a lot of respect for Ouija boards. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. We. Uh, Turned off all the lights. We lit, lit a few candles, and uh, I had my my girlfriend and her friend sit across from each other with a Ouija board on their lap, and the other two youngsters were just on the side watching. This was great Friday night entertainment. So I just started asking questions, and I said, uh, I said, you know, the two girls, uh, my girlfriend and her friend, had their hands on a little pointer thing, and I said, I want you two to look eye to eye the whole time because I wanted to make sure that they wouldn't be able to see what was going on on the board, okay? Right. 
So I was asking questions, very general questions, like, you know, is there anybody out there? You know, stuff like that. And, you know, they'd move the thing around and it go, you know, close to yes, stuff like that. And I was like, okay, well, let's, uh, let's narrow it down a little bit more. Uh, are you a, a boy or a girl? You know, and it, it, it fooled around the board and eventually we ended up getting some sort of man. Okay, I couldn't tell you the history of this man. But it started to feel a little bit eerie. It started to feel like the board was was not joking around. You know, it was it was starting to talk to us. Right. And uh so needless to say we were all feeling a little tense to begin with. And uh I started asking questions like, Are you a a, a good man? And you know, I go to no, of course. I say, You're a bad man and then I go to yes. And this whole time uh, the people who are moving the board are not looking at the board. And I was asking the questions, and I was reading the answers. So the, the younger girls are starting to freak. I'm starting to freak. So I say, well, yeah. it's about time that I ask a question that's going to call his bluff, that's going to prove that this really isn't happening. So I said, well, how many people are in this room right now? And it went to six. And at first I was like, oh, you see, I told you. But then it hit me that there were five of us in the room, and he was the extra one. <laughs> and it was six, and we, I mean, we just freaked. Yes, of the, course. The, the, the young girls bust out into tears. We felt a presence in the room that uh, scared the living daylights out of us. It was, it was unbelievable. So I just... All I can tell you is my experience with the Ouija board was similar, and I won't get within a 1,000 miles of one. I'll never touch one again. You know, and, and, and of the weekend after that, we were like, you know, y'all want to do it, y'all want to do it, but no thanks. No it, thanks. It really, to this day, 10 years later, I still remember it, and I still tell this story. Uh, and I, I believe every word of it. Thank you very much for it. Um, look, I won't even talk about it, but I'll, I'll tell you that uh, you be wary. Don't think it's fun. Ouija boards are invitations to... Uh, it, it's like... Uh, I guess it's like getting on the radio and inviting everybody in the audience over to your house. You know, you have no idea who's going to come through the door. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hi. How are you doing this morning, Art? Well, I'm okay, I guess. I'm getting a little freaked out at my own program, like usual, but I'm all right. Uh, that, you know, it just goes with the territory. Yeah. Um, now, this is from uh, an earlier caller. He was on the Enterprise back in 1982. That's correct. Um I was on the Enterprise in 1984. And oh, really? I can, I can verify what he was saying. I was in a different department, but I can definitely verify what he was saying. Really? Yeah. Um, mine is from the same time frame, 84 to 88. I was in a, in a squadron, uh, one of the six spring squadrons that was on board. We were uh, to do some temporary duty on the USS uh, just for Independence. And so a few of us went over there with it. I'm, I'm one of the cooks out of that squadron. So uh -huh. I said, yeah, I'll go with the guys, no problem. Right. And uh, we were told that, you know, some strange things happened on board that ship. And I'm going, okay, yeah, whatever. Well, I'm in one of the, the voids. It's a, a room that's just used for whatever. And this one just so happened to be for a lot of our dry storage for the for the galleys. Mm -hmm. And me and this one guy from that's normal ship's company we're sitting there we're talking we're going over inventory and he goes hey you want to hear something real really freaky i said okay i said first of all you got to turn down the radio well there was no stereo in the room <laughs> okay there's a bunch of music he goes well that's part of it i said okay and he goes you just stick around here for a little while you're gonna you're gonna see something really strange now you know there's boxes all over the place with uh, cans of dried goods or from fruits and stuff like that. You're talking around 25 to 30 pounds each box. And all of a sudden, at the complete other end, the boxes are just starting to fly. What? Like something is just going right through them. And I'm the one that's facing it, and the guy's looking the other way. We're standing right there by the hatch. And he just sees this look on my face, and he grabs me, and he pulls me right through the hatch, and he slams it shut, and it sounds like something just ran right into the hatch. Oh, shit. And I'm going... What in the hell was that? He goes, oh, that's just the beginning. You don't know about this ship. And uh, there was nobody else in there but us two. Mm. And we had already looked everywhere. Right, we were going through making our inventory. He goes, come on, I'm going to show you something else. So we go into this other void that's completely empty. 
except over on one one of the bulkheads, one of the walls, there was a former hatch there, but it was all bolted down. Right. I'm going, okay, so this is, you know, nothing new. I used to play poker in some of these rooms and stuff like that on the Enterprise. And he goes, oh, no, just sit here and listen. So we're sitting there just shooting the breeze for a little bit, and all of a sudden I hear a whole bunch of banging and a whole bunch of yelling. And it was kind of muffled. It sounded like it was coming from the other side of the wall. And I'm going, okay, so what's going on? And it was getting louder and louder and louder. And it was, the more that you listen to it, the more you can hear, help us, help us, don't let us drown, just, you know, help us, all this. I'm going, what is going on here? And he goes, come on, we're going to go explain it to you. So I'm sitting there with a whole bunch of these other you're, guys. You're telling me this is a bolted hatch? Bolted hatch. What had happened was a torpedo hit perfect right into the uh, one of the old tanks where they used to hold the um, jet fuel. And there were a whole bunch of guys down there at that time scrubbing it out because it had been contaminated with something. They had to completely empty it, scrub it down, dry it, and then refuel it with uh, jet fuel. No problem. Well, well, these guys were down in it. I believe it was during World War II, a direct torpedo hit right into that uh, tank. It was already empty, so it didn't, you know, completely blow up. But all these guys drowned in there. They had to close all the hatches that led to it, so it was called watertight integrity. This way, the water wouldn't spread out throughout the ship. Right. All right. But uh, all these men drowned right. in there. And, you and that's what you were hearing? Oh, yeah, that's what we were hearing. I don't, I don't know if I could stay on board a ship like that. Well... There, oh, there's a lot more. <laughs> going up, to the, now this is all on the independence. Go up there to the bridge to go visit a couple of friends of mine that I knew from high school that I knew were there. And uh, I was telling them about these two experiences, and they said, oh, that's nothing. And all there was more. And just as I said that, all the instruments were blanking. Um, the uh, standard compass that we have, a humongous compass, at least three feet in circumference, yes, sir. was just spinning. It was just going like it was hooked up to a mechanism to where it was just going to start spinning. I hear you. Well, electromagnetic disturbance around things like this fairly common. Yeah, it was just, I mean, to this day I will never forget it, especially hearing the screams that were on the other side of that bulkhead where those guys were that had drowned, and then seeing all those boxes fly around, 25 to 30 pounds each. I would not handle that well. Uh, no. I appreciate the call. I appreciate the story. Thank you. I wouldn't handle that one well at all. Not well at all. You know, the, the implication of that is, and I'm still trying to figure this out as we handle these kinds of stories, uh, What what is that? Uh, certainly it cannot be the lingering souls of men who died such a horrible death. Kenneth, reliving that again and again, with some kind of hellish consciousness. No, I wouldn't handle that well at all. Uh, good morning. You're on the air on Ghost to Ghost AM, if you will. I'm Mark Bell. Where are you, please? Hello. Hello. Hi, my Hi. name's Denise. I'm calling from Sacramento, California. Hi, Denise. And the story I have for you, by the way, I've really been enjoying the, those stories. Well, enjoying is a word, I guess. I'm not sure if it's a proper one for some of what we've heard, but... Uh, not some of them. Yeah. Perhaps. Anyway. So anyway, my story is, um, my mother, she uh, drove down to... Lodi, California, yesterday. Both of my grandparents are buried there. Oh, yes. And she went down to see <clears throat> her uncle, my grandmother's brother, mm -hmm. with her brother, my uncle. And they usually stop by the cemetery to see my grandparents. And she is not a believer in ghosts. But uh, I think, I don't know, she might have changed her mind after yesterday. She went by the grave site. And she usually goes by to um, do a little visiting. And she was knelt down, had been, she was saying some prayers, she says to herself. Right. She says, this, all of a sudden, there was this film in front of her. It was just 
like a film. And she said it wasn't there that long. And she said, then pretty soon it was just gone. And she said, it was strange. So I said, you don't believe in ghosts, huh? She, she's not a believer, but I am. And there are a couple other odd things that have happened with that particular. Well, I'm a believer. I, I don't know, I don't know exactly what ghosts are. Oh, I don't either. But they are something. And, um, and what, I'll tell you what I want to believe. Thank you. I, I want to believe that they are the echo, the remnant of what once was, not the remaining consciousness of what is. Because to believe that, as that man said in that terrifying story, that those men eternally remain reliving that horrible death again and again, that drowning, that's too much. I don't want to believe that. I would rather, I'd much rather believe that like an endless tape loop, it's some sort of what a weak echo of what was. But I can't be sure of that. Can you? East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Good morning, Art. Good morning to you. And how are you doing this eerie evening? Well, I was better earlier. I, I understand that. <laughs> Well, uh, like the previous one of the previous caller, I am calling from New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans again? Like Metairie. Yes. Um, now, for most listeners, if you've never been to New Orleans, it is a very eerie place to come to. It, it really is. Yeah, especially at night, they have uh, vampire tours now. Oh, vampire tours? Uh -huh. In the French Quarter, you can take a vampire tour. You can take haunted, you know, mansion tours. I absolutely am coming to New Orleans. You know what? There. Art, it's amazing the things that you'll find out here. Especially, one of the most amazing things to visit, if you are not, you know, a, a native of New Orleans, one of the things that you'd want to come to if you were a tourist is the cemeteries. Mm -hmm. The cemeteries are unlike any other cemetery in the world. Okay, because all the cemeteries are above ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're, I mean, they're just, they're, they're tremendous and just, some of the sculptures and statues in these cemeteries are just... It's, it kind of sounds like the one I was in in Paris. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but what I'm calling to, to tell you tonight is um, uh, there's suburbs of New Orleans called New Orleans East. And I do live in these suburbs. Uh, there's one particular suburb called Village de Les. Now, uh, as story goes from way back when, Village de Les used to be kind of like an Indian... Not you can't really call it reservation, but the Natchez Indians used to settle on this land. It was a lot of swamp land. Right. Um, now how the story went was when an Indian died, uh, or when a Native American died, one of the Natchez tribe, they would take the Native American and put him in an old oak tree. When that oak tree fell, whether naturally, you know, or if lightning struck it or something, the soul of that Indian would go up, you know, to wherever. Hmm. Okay. Now, here's how the story goes. There are a lot of haunted houses or houses that are haunted or people here, things or whatever, in this subdivision, yes. especially on one particular block where I have a good friend of mine who lives there, Teddy. Um, now, we've heard, you know, things go on in that house, you know, like sometimes real late at night you hear like a faint jingle of bells, you know, something like that. Or you hear beating on walls, you know, or you just feel gusts, you know, small gusts of wind from nowhere. Yes. You know, eerie things. So we had a friend of ours who was, a, who, you know, she was a Native American also, and she had a father, she had an uncle, um, who practiced it, you know, who practiced and always went to, uh, um, the tribe things. I can't remember what you call them. Tribal, um, tribal gatherings. Yeah, exactly. In Mississippi. Listen, um, we're at the bottom of the hour. I've got a break here, so stay right where you are, will you? Okay. Now, I've never heard that before. It reminds me of a book I read. They would actually bury their dead in a tree and wait for the tree to fall for the soul to ascend. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM.
Andrea's uncle was explaining to us that they're evil and that they're upset because they're stuck in, like he said, limbo. They're not going anywhere. They're staying right there. They cannot get out. But the day that he burned that sage, there has never been another incident occur in that house. Well, he said that we shook something up in there when we played around with something bad. He said that what happened was we were doing, we were getting in over our heads, in other words. Mm -hmm. Very we easy were, to do. We were playing, he said, we were playing with fire too close to gasoline. <laughs> and he said that that really, really upset the evil spirits that they have in that house. You know, and it kind of, you know, peed off, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the good spirit. So, because the good spirit was trying to keep the evil away from them away from us. Um, but uh, Andrea's uncle came in, and he was the one that explained to us about the Natchez Indian burying their dead in the trees. And when that tree would fall, you know, from age or whatever, then the spirit, you know, of would that be released, yes. would be released. Mm -hmm. And um, he explained to us that those were a couple bodies, and there are there are a couple other spirits in other houses out there in Village the Last that are haunted. You know, well, and uh, as, I, as I said earlier, even at the best of times, sir, in your city, uh, it's a haunted kind of place. Now, I think that the book that I read that kind of parallels what he just said, actually it comes pretty close to it, is called Speaker for the Dead. You ever get a chance to uh, read Speaker for the Dead, definitely do it. In fact, I, I, I've been meaning to interview the author of that book for some time, and I, almost, I had it lined up, and I don't know what I did. It must have slipped by me. I'll get on that again. Good morning. You're on the air uh, in what we call Ghost to Ghost AM. Where are you, please? Hi, this is Kelly in Soda Springs, Idaho. Kelly, we have a big hum on the phone here. Oh, okay. That's the other line. Can you hold on one second? Sure. You have to hang on up, Dana. Oh, I see. We've got we've got two on the line here. So that was my husband on the other line. Well, we have we, a couple stories for you. Okay, but we still have hum. Still. Still have a lot of hum. Yes. Wow. Um, I mean, I can hear you, but it's like something's. Uh, let me shut off my computer. Maybe that's what it is. Let's see if that's it. Could it be your computer? It is now safe to turn your computer off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's still right. there. Anyway, go ahead and tell us one. Is that better? Uh, uh, no, but go ahead and uh, give us your best one. Okay. Um. Well, about three years ago, my daughter was two, and every night at twelve twenty-six, every night she'd wake up screaming, 12, not 26. screaming scared, and not screaming upset, but screaming pissed. You know, like if you went in and you shook somebody awake and then you hid? Oh, yes. Okay. She was mad. You could tell she was just mad. Yeah. So I'd run upstairs and calm her down, put her back to sleep, and I'd go back down to bed. Well, one particular night, it was hot. It was just dripping sweat. I got to bed. I even I told my husband, if that booger wakes her up tonight, mm -hmm. I'm going to be so mad. He's going to get it. You know, I don't know what... How do you get a ghost, right? So... She woke him up, or, or he woke her up. And at 12.26, I go upstairs. I'm trying to calm her down. I'm ripping this ghost a new butt. And I finally get her calmed down. I go back downstairs. I'm even more dripping wet because of the heat from upstairs. And I'm tossing and turning, trying to go back to sleep. And all of a sudden, I feel this, like, cool fingers go across my neck. And I was turning around just you know, I asked my husband what he did that for, and he's rolled over on his other side, sound asleep. Oh, my. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, you know, that was kind of weird, and it never did scare me. Um, within 20 seconds, the temperature in the room dropped a good 15, 20 degrees to cool it off. And, I, you know, I got the feeling that that he was apologizing to me in his own way. 
appeasing me. I don't know. Never woke her up again that night, after that night. So, in other words, your little tantrum... Uh, yeah, I did throw a tantrum. Yes, I did. And it worked. Wow, what a story. Where, what part of the country are you in? We live in a very small town in Idaho called Soda Springs. It's like 1,300 people. Or 1,100 people, I'm sorry. And a lot of old, old, old uh, buildings. A lot of... It's it's an old mining community, a lot of deaths in the mines. and um, This will happen to be a little boy who turned out to be my daughter's best friend for a while. And they'd walk along holding hands and talking. And she'd hold his hand and they'd walk along. And all of a sudden a chair that'd be in the middle of the room would tip over like he walked right past, you know, right over top of it. <laughs> and she was, with her hand was a good foot away. I mean, it, it's just weird. All kinds of fun stuff like that. But never a bad thing. We never felt uh, threatened in any way. You know, he pulled tricks on us. Well, that is a, that is a remarkable story. I mean, uh, th thank you very much to uh, take off at a ghost, to get angry at a at a spirit, and to literally read it the riot act. First of all, I don't know how you'd have the guts to do that, but I suppose eventually waking up enough time to a, a times to a screaming child, you might do it. And then to to feel a cold hand on the back of your neck and feel a temperature drop of 20 degrees in a room. And then to have that entity go away. Hmm. You've got to wonder. Some of it seems so conscious. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Where are you? I'm from Redding, California. Redding, California. Mm-hmm. All right, you've been having some earthquakes up there, haven't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I have. It's been really rocking and rolling. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, it's swarming yeah. up there. So. Yeah, there was two yesterday and then one today. Uh-huh. So what's up? Um, I have a story from... I'm 15 years old now, and it was in eighth grade. Okay. Yes, and um, eighth grade, junior high. Uh, my junior high has a theater a big, an old, old theater. The junior high is uh, dated back from 1911. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a play there. It was my first play. I had the lead role. And all throughout the play, well, there has been plays before about speculation that the, the theater is haunted because all the time the house lights, brand new house lights, would go on and off and on and off and on and off. The whole audience saw it. And the stagehands backstage could see the light switch going up and down and up and down. Your name's not Carrie, is it? No, it's not. Okay. It's Heidi. Heidi. Yes. Heidi. That's just as good. All right, Heidi. <laughs> and um, and then there'd be pounding on the top part when nobody would be up there. You could actually, going back, you could actually see the switch going on and off? Yes, my friend was the stage manager, and she was there doing the house lights, and she wasn't even touching them. The, the light switch was going on and off and on and off by itself. Be enough for me right there. Uh-huh. It was pretty scary. And the the pounding on the top part, the catwalk on the top um, above the house lights yes. was pounding like footsteps running across. Yes. And then the, the side entrances going to backstage... The curtains were flapping back and forth like somebody was pushing them around. Mm. And, well, I while the, all this was happening, I was the lead of the play, so I was getting into costumes and stuff, and I knew something wrong was going on, but uh, nobody was really... I, I really wasn't following, but I was really nervous because was, it was the first play that I was ever doing, and I was the lead. Sure. And I could, like... I don't know if I could actually physically hear it, but I heard... I felt like a girl's whisper in my head saying, you're going to do all right, I'm looking over over you, um, you're going to do great, just go on there and and um, you're going to do fine because I'm watching over you. I could hear this person whispering in my head, it was, I could just feel a presence of a ghost or something around me and I, I it was kind of, it was actually kind of neat, I wasn't that scared, <laughs> but the, the, uh, the first that the house lights going on and off, that was, it was just kind of like this. Who do you Child think? having fun. <laughs> Who do you think was talking to you, Heidi? 
nobody was around me. Um, like I was, I was behind the curtain by myself. No, I know you were hearing this. Who do you think it was? Um, well, I I have heard stories that, but they have been just stories. You know, I thought they were just stories of a girl. Um, a long time ago, like when the the school just opened, performing a play, and she she uh, I, I don't know if she died in the theater or she died, but she really liked the the theater itself. So mm -hmm. she might have kept that as a home or something. And I think it might have been her, you know, telling me that I was going to do all right. Right. You know, I I don't want to believe that somebody like that would remain even in a theater, mm -hmm. even in a place they loved, mm -hmm. eternally. I mean, mm -hmm. Heidi, doesn't that seem to you like like a hell, sort of? Yes. Mm-hmm. It does. One imagines something... Uh, it seems like... It feels like a restless kind of spirit, like she doesn't want to stay there. That's why she makes so much mis mischief and everything, you know? Precisely. It's like, you know, on the house lights and pounding up in the stairs that ways and messing with the curtains and everything. Heidi, how did the play go? Uh, it went fine after that. Um, besides, it, everybody was just... They all thought um, that it was a trick, which it was all right. We didn't want the audience to get scared, so we just let them think that it was a trick. That so they, ne so they never really knew. They thought that was part of the act. No, I think they just thought it was part of the act, yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, like the backstage people told their families and stuff, but um, yeah, it was. We all felt we all felt it, you know, and we we're pretty serious about our um, craft, so we wouldn't really do anything like that because it's pretty unprofessional anyway. Uh huh. So, um, it, it was it was something else. It was it was pretty interesting. <laughs> I really appreciate your story, Heidi. Okay, thank you. You bet. Good night. And I'm glad you uh, did well on the play. <laughs> Wild card line, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, hi, Art. How you doing? Okay. Okay, well, I had a story that happened uh, about 24 years ago. I was living in a rooming house, and the, the lady that owned the house was 89 years old. She lived in the front part of the house. It was separated from the other sleeping rooms. Right. And uh, I got out of the military and kind of a rogue and stuff. Anyway, I was had stayed there for, oh, maybe six months or so, and she asked me if I wanted to come in and play a game, and I thought, well, she, she's going to have to play checkers or something like that or something along that line. I got in there, and the room was dimly lit, and she sat down at the table, and she pulled out this Ouija board. That kind of a game, huh? Yeah, and uh, she started to show me how to do it, and we, we proceeded with it, and it starts spelling out old-fashioned names, first names, like Horace and Elmer. She had been married four or five times before, and she told me that these were the names of her husbands. And that the more we played it, probably went on 45 minutes to an hour, the faster that would go across the board, that little triangle-shaped yes. thing would go across there. Yes. As it was, at the point, it was almost flying off there. At one point, she had some tea there. She asked me to go uh, to the kitchen and get a cup. And I went to the kitchen and opened the, the door. And this is no lie. She had hundreds of cockroaches crawling all through her cabinets. Uh, and she had honey in jars where she said she was catching them. And uh, so I, I had enough of that. I didn't want any tea or anything else. I went back, and we, we continued to play that game. But it turned into, I just felt real eerie, like the hair was standing on the back of my neck. And that it got so out of control that that triangle little uh, deal that we were working would just fly off, off the uh, off the table just about. So that was a uh, you know pretty scary. My friend, myself. that that would be it for me. I, I've got to go. We're at the top of the hour. You're on the air, Coast to Coast AM, or is it Ghost to Ghost AM? Good morning. Hi. Hi there. This is Joe. I'm uh, calling from Jamestown, New York. Hi, Joe. Hi. I'm um, just so glad you called me. I can't believe it. Well, I I'm love doing your that, show. Selectively doing that, looking at <laughs> stories, and if they seem interesting, I'm I'm calling a few people. Well, this is so great. Um, first of all, um, I guess what, to start the whole thing, um, I've been living in a it's my dream home, and it was a home uh, in Frewsburg, New York, which probably no one's ever heard of before because it's, it's kind of like a Mayberry, and a very small town but beautiful community. And uh, But it's been known to be haunted because it was built in 1840, and it's a part of the Underground Railroad. So it has the tunnels and the um, uh, false fireplace. There may be some people who don't know what the under, Underground uh, Railroad is. 
The Underground Railroad was uh, all of the connections that were made from the south all the way up to Canada to help the slaves escape from the south. So this was a home that was built while it was being built he was an abolitionist, and he actually built his home to provide for this uh, so that he would help uh, keep the slaves in a safe area, even though they wouldn't just hide in these little cubby holes or anything for a long period of time. Only if the sheriffs would come uh, would they need to hide. But um, they, they had it all protected so that they could help to, uh, when it was safe. And they would move on to another station closer and closer, uh, like up through the route, came through uh, Silver Creek, Buffalo, that kind of area, and then up into Canada until they were free right. from the country. Right. So, and this is, and it's written up in all the books and everything because it's one of the few places left standing. <laughs> Which makes us kind of nervous because it is old and, and it's huge and it's, um, and it has all its, uh, little hiding places and, and uh, beautiful wood and the reason I chose it was because it was I ha I love antiques and but and I knew it was haunted um, from the stories that I'd heard in the small town you know it, they people talk um, but it didn't bother me because that kind of thing doesn't bother me um, but and um, but we had first right away uh, we were doing our as, I, as we moved in with my one-year-old, we were doing all the painting and, re, you know, refurbishing the home and doing things that we needed to do to fix it up. But right away, we could tell that there was an entity there. Right. Um, I had the first thing that happened was when a when my little girl who had cerebral palsy, she couldn't even turn or crawl, you know, move to crawl, but she was eyeing a ball that was like six six feet away from her. And she wanted it so badly, but um, and we were busy painting, and I took a little break, and I sat down in a chair, and I had one eye on her, and one eye on still my work I was going to do, but instead, I'll, I see this little red and white ball just not roll to her, but huh. move to her, about six feet, just slide across the floor to her, so now she can see it, and she's playing with it, and I'm and I'm I'm standing up thinking. I can't believe what I'm looking at. You know, this just doesn't seem... <laughs> I know what I, I want to describe to people, but I, I, I don't know how to. And that was just the beginning. And in that house, we knew that the, the entities were friendly, but we just knew that they were, they were, they were doing a lot of things in the house, um, and, but mostly uh, friendly things, and nothing to scare us, just to let them... They wanted to let us know that they were there. We have like those latches, the antique iron latches that are on the inside of these older homes. Right. Yet they have the thumb on one side, you know, to to lift up the latch on the other side. And uh, after there was just some knocking noise to let me know that there was it was kind of like a warning that that there was a presence in the room. And then the next thing I know, I'm I'm standing right at this door, it's an inner door. No wind, no scientific reason why they should move, and all of a sudden, just the inner latch is going up and down. And I, and I, so I thought, well, what, you're supposed to talk to these spirits, and see if they might, you know, uh, <laughs> do something else to yeah. communicate with you. But as soon as I did, then it stopped. Um, and there have been, um, oh, like you can hear someone speaking. Downstairs, like if you're upstairs, you can hear voices, and you know how you, if, if it's in a different room, you don't really know exactly what they're saying, but you know someone is speaking. You can't really actually hear the, the words that they're saying. This sounds saying. exactly like a story a man sent me, a really eerie story not long ago. Um, as a matter of fact, let me uh, tell you that story. And thank you. This man uh, is technically knowledgeable he's a ham as I am and I'm sorry that I didn't save the story but roughly here it is he and his wife slept in one room his children in another they were small children and the children would be awakened in the middle of the night with voices indistinct busy voices uh, you could sort of just barely hear what they were, you know, kind of like 
kind of like you would hear voices carried on the wind from a neighbor's house, something like that. But the voices were so loud in the children's room that it would wake the children up at night. And the man finally uh, went into his children's room, and he had to stand on a chair in order to hear the voices. But he heard them not clearly, but with enough volume to be bothered. And he had to be in one particular spot. Now, this man monitored these voices for months. And here's the really eerie part. He had to be in one particular place to hear the voices. And the voices would move about an inch or two every day. Every day. And he monitored these voices until finally they exited the house, the spot where you could hear them, and literally moved across his backyard until finally he had to literally stand on the brick, you know, the, the, the block wall by the back of his house to hear the voices. And there they were, chattering away. Months later, they had moved, uh, what? 50 or 60 or 70 feet, and they just kept going. Now, you tell me what he was hearing. He ran through just about everything. Could it be RF from a radio station nearby? No. He ruled that out. What could it possibly be? Some sort of rip, some sort of tear in the continuum? Something from time past? Almost probably that. And as far as he knows, they just kept moving. This little spot where the voices could be heard just kept moving. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. Hello. How are you? A little freaked out, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Marie, and I'm calling from Crow Heart, Wyoming. Yes, ma'am. And we're on the Wind River Indian Reservation, and they call it the land of the little people. Ah. But my story doesn't start here anyway. <laughs> All right. We lived in Oregon, and this uh, happened to me about 22 years ago. Right. This was in 1976. My daughter had a friend, and um, she would come over and stay at our house. My daughter would go down there and stay with her. And one night, um, her friend and her brother were, were driving down our this little road. We lived way out in the country, uh, about 15 miles out of uh, Sutherland, Oregon. And um, her brother and her were going down our, our country road, and... I, he, they, I'm not really sure what happened to him, but they wound up going off an, um, an embankment about 100 feet down into the ravine. And he helped her crawl up the side of the hill, and they were hurt pretty bad, but he got her up to the side of the hill, and just as she got up to the top of the road, he fell back down. Well, she made it about a, a quarter of a mile to a half of a mile to where the fire department was, and she got some help. Well... Needless to say, he didn't make it, and she wound up in the hospital. And I worked nights. I worked at the Denny's restaurant there, and I worked graveyard shift. And, or actually, wasn't graveyard, but until midnight, and I'd have to come home through that road. Well, like the day after the accident happened, I would come to the area where they had gone off the road, and there was this aborigine standing in the road with his hands up in the air. Oh, my. And I... It, it kind of scared me, and I didn't know that if I should go keep going or stop or what I should do. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to go past. So I went on home, and I, I told my husband about it, and the following night the same thing happened. And this happened for like three or four nights. And my daughter got a call from her friend that was in the hospital, and she asked her if she could come and see her. So I took my daughter in to see her, and... Um, I really didn't understand why I was seeing this in the road. I mean, to me, it was sort of, you know, what do you want, what's going on, you know, type thing. It was like he was restless or something was going on and trying to tell me something. At least that's how I felt. So I took my daughter in to see her friend at the hospital, and she went in to see her, and then she asked my daughter if she would, mi if I would mind going in and seeing her. Right. So I, I said, well, okay, I'd go in. And my daughter waited for me out in the hall, and it was just her friend and I in the room. And she started telling me that it was all her fault that her brother died, that um, she could have done something to help him. And, you know, um, 
what, you know, she was just crying, and I just, I finally told her, I said, you, it was not your fault. There was nothing that you could have done to change the situation. And after that, I didn't see him in the road anymore. Wow. It was almost like I was to go to tell her because she wanted to commit suicide. She wanted to end her life because she felt like she was responsible for what happened to him. And after I went and saw her and, and told her that it wasn't her fault, then I felt like a big weight was lift, lifted off of me, and, and she got well. Remarkable. Was, Absolutely remarkable. It was really a strange situation. <laughs> Did it make you a believer? Oh, definitely, because I had something else happen to me in 80, and it was sort of a, a, a situation where we lived in a little tiny trailer, and I kept getting this odor, um, and I couldn't figure out what it was at first, and we had this dog that kept looking behind her. Well, it, this odor that I kept getting was sort of like, I could smell like my grandfather. You know how certain people, they eat certain things, and they have just an odor about them. Sure. Well, he always ate um, Cheerios and all brand for breakfast and toast, and that's what I kept smelling. <laughs> now, they lived in New York, and we were in Oregon. And my dog kept looking behind her one day and growling, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And the following day, I got a phone call from my mother that my grandfather had passed away. And it was, it, I knew he had been there. There's every reason to believe that those who pass away, even those who move on, linger long enough near loved ones. So I hadn't seen him in probably 20 years. I hear and I think it was just his way of making sure that me and my family were fine and then he was okay. A very common story. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Bye. And listen, I'm getting a, um, a lot of um, email here indicating, well, let me read you one from Jay. Warning, 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 solar images. Um, look out. Here comes a big solar flare. And this one is a big one. We'll try and get the information up on the website um, tonight, if not tomorrow. So there apparently has been a very, very large solar flare. And we'll uh, try and keep you updated. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello? Hello. Hi, how are you, Art? <laughs> I'm okay. Where are you? I am in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City. Oh, the story I'm about to tell you, although it does not happen here, happens in central South Dakota. Central South Dakota. Right, Mitchell to be exact. Tell me something. Are they saying bad things about me on Kansas City Talk Radio? You know what? Um, my husband turned me on to you this evening, and I work in a bar. And uh, he said he kind of got freaked out yesterday about some uh, Catholic uh, pastor talking about Oh, oh yes, that was another program. No, um, this relates to a possible curse placed on the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> I've been getting some really nasty. And, and anyway, uh, I'm a Raiders fan, so you're a Raiders. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, so am I. Actually, all right, go ahead. Um, about early 1990, or not? I'm sorry, mid 1991. Um, I had I just filed for divorce, and I found out three weeks later that I was pregnant with my second child. Oh boy! Which is, you know, not great. Not great. And um, I was living with his family in a little town called Parkston, South Dakota, mm -hmm. and not very happy. And uh, I was thinking about um, an abortion, which I have a very Catholic family. I understand. And the Catholic upbringing, but at the time, I was so sick of religion, I didn't think about church, I didn't care. No, you were in the middle of a divorce, take, and taking a long way home, sort of, and uh, thinking about an abortion. Listen... This sounds like a very interesting story. Can I? We're, we're at a break. Can I put you on hold? Yes. All right. Uh, we will come back after the break and finish this one up. Can you imagine that? Are there worse, uh, more serious human situations than that? You file for divorce. You're with your family, and you find out you're pregnant. You begin thinking about an abortion. It's your second child. I don't know. It doesn't get much rougher than that, does it? From the high desert, where the clouds and the rain and the mist are moving in on kind of a creepy night, this is Coast to Coast AM. I wonder if they speeded up her voice or if she just had 10 cups of coffee to do that. All right, well, anyway, you're back, and I cannot imagine a worse situation. Uh, filing for divorce, uh, you find out you're pregnant, you're living with your family. And you think you pardon me? His family. He is even worse yet. 
mm-hmm. and you're considering an abortion. Right. Okay. So at the time, I decided to take a part-time job to get away from my situation, correct my thoughts. And I happened to land a job in Emory, South Dakota, which, where he grew up, actually, where he went to high school and grade school, mm-hmm. working for a couple, um, husband and wife, well into their 80s, and uh, the gentleman's wife had Alzheimer's. Oh, yes. You know, and not being in a great situation as I was. Not at all. It was very difficult for me. And so things proceeded, and one afternoon I just got set up, and uh, and not to be, you know, um, caught, I used a pay phone and looked in the other pages. I was desperate, and I looked under abortion. This wonderful lady came on the phone, and I said, you know, I need help. And uh, she said, let me pick you up this afternoon. I'm going to take you to my office here in Mitchell. I said, you have it. You got it. So she shows me all these films, and I was totally disgusted. And she says, I'm going to give you another option. So I have this wonderful lady who lives down the street. She's 73 years old. She's looking for a roommate. I said, really? She goes, you know you don't want to do this. So you're right or don't. So I moved in with this lady. She was 73 years old, and she got me back into church. Mm-hmm. And I started going to church faithfully and doing church functions, and I decided to get rebaptized in a Christian church. All right. And so I was going through the classes, and I was teaching some youth classes, and uh, at the time I was working um, at a computer place that made um, floppy disks, and I was going to school. And uh, I remember the pastor telling me, you know, Tracy, there's going to be a time, there's, there's a door here, and you're about reaching that time, you're going to have to make a decision. You know, either you want to go with the Lord or you want to go elsewhere. He says, and someone will try you. And I thought he was just full of it, you know. Growing up in a big family, big Catholic family, I'd never been in that kind of position. Mm-hmm. So one evening, and it kind of struck me weird, and one evening um, I left both doors open. I, I slept in the basement, and uh, there was two doors to my room, and I left the television on. And I, I read my, my path out of my Bible, and I went to sleep. And I don't know what time it was in the morning, because it's awful dark in the basement, being one little window underground. Sure. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear two doors slam and the TV turn off. I'm freaking out. <laughs> yeah, of course. Somebody's there. And then I open my eyes, and I see not an apparition, but a silhouette with two red eyes like you saw from Amityville Horror. Yes. I have chills right now, <laughs> remembering this. And this, this voice said, come with me. Come with me. Now, I heard other people talking about being paralyzed. Yes. I was paralyzed. I couldn't scream. I couldn't say anything. And all of a sudden in my mind, all I remember in my mind saying was, Jesus save me. Jesus save me. And then I, then I was able to roll over on my belly and put a pillow over my head. And it, it was gone. And the next day, the doors were still open. And the TV was on. Mm-hmm. So we went and uh, we talked to the pastor about this because I'm freaking out. Selma, being her room right upstairs, never heard a thing. And uh, the, um, the pastor came down and he anointed all the doorknobs and he blessed the whole house. And I never heard anything again after that. And uh, now I have... Do you, do you wonder sometimes whether there was a subliminal or not such a subliminal suggestion given to you by the priest which caused this in your own mind or if it was absolutely real it was real i mean i i even thought through that you know being um i was uh 22 and you know i'm like i know i'm more intelligent than this you know my mind doesn't play tricks on me and i mean i looked a couple times at this thing. And I, I just saw his eyes. And it came close. I take it you went ahead with the divorce. I went ahead with the divorce, and I had a very happy, healthy child that was born on Valentine's Day. I appreciate the story. Thank you. Thank you. You take care. You too. Red eyes. Uh, well, card line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello. How are you doing, Art? I'm okay, sir. Where are you? Uh, Northern California. All right. Um... I'm an investigator for the county here, and I had to go up to this place uh, about 25 miles up this old dirt road. Yes. And uh, the people I was talking to, uh, 
they told me that this house is haunted as I'm on this property and nobody lived in it. When you say you're an investigator for the county, what do you mean? I'm a fraud investigator. Fra oh, fraud, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I was talking to them and uh, they told me a few stories about this house uh, uh, getting attacked by this mean uh, male ghost. And I kind of just blew it off. Then I talked to my girlfriend uh, the next day and told her about it. And she talked me into going up there. So we spent a total of six nights up there and uh, got some really neat pictures. Um, when we first went into the house, um, everything seemed to be okay. But then we smelled a, like, rotting flesh. Rotting, Rot rotting flesh. Yeah. Real, real strong odor. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with a lot of cold spots in the, in the house. And the majority of it seemed to be in the kitchen and in the hallway. We looked around, couldn't find anything. Of course, this house hasn't been lived in in 10 years either. Uh, so later on, uh, my girlfriend and her daughter decided to play with the Ouija board. Mm. And that's when everything really started to get exciting. Um, I'm taking pictures and playing with the Ouija board, and it's probably around 11, 12 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, um, the chair flies back that she's sitting in, my girlfriend. She gets up, she's holding her knee, and uh, she had the guy kicked in the knee, or hit in the knee, which left a bruise. Immediately after that, the door, which is right behind me, the handle turned. <laughs> now, this is, there's no one around. And it's close to midnight if it wasn't midnight. Right. I was ready to go at that point. But since, you know, we're so far back there on this dirt road, I decided to go ahead and spend the night. Of course, I can't sleep. <clears throat> and we're all laying in the living room. And uh, then I hear footsteps upstairs, uh, like children running. There's also supposed to be two children, ghost children in this house also. Mm -hmm. Now, six months ago, I wouldn't have believed this until it happened to me. Here are uh, footsteps running upstairs and a door slammed. And I decided to go ahead and take the tape recorder out at that time and set it up and just let it play. And um, the next day I listened to the tape recorder. I heard a small child say, help me, help me twice. Never heard this. Never, ever heard it. Um, just incredible. Just incredible. Got pictures of orbs. Uh, orbs in motion. There was, uh, sent them to the ghost web and he posted a few of them and I finally made my own website because I have about 400 pictures. 400? Yeah, that I've taken up there in that six day. Why don't you send me, <clears throat> excuse me, some email and, uh, give me your site. I'll take a look and put up a link. Okay. You bet. How would that be? All right. You bet. Okay. Thank That's you very much and take care. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would like to get any ghost photographs that anybody has. So if you've got a good one, <laughs> by all means, send it to Art Bell uh, at P.O. Box 4755 in Haunted Pahrump, that's P-A-H-R-U-M-P, Nevada, zip code 89041-47. Five, five, and if you cannot scan them, I would be more than happy to scan them for you and get them up. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, Art. Hello. Uh, it's Mike from A of, of Philly, Philadelphia, PA. Philadelphia. Yes, I'm a little nervous. No, that's all right. Relax. Um, about 14 months ago, me and my wife and my dog and my kid moved to a house. It was about in the 40s. And I showed my stepfather the, the, the basement. Mm-hmm. And I was standing about six feet away from him, and he was only standing on the stairs. And I seen this apparition of a man walking behind him, going towards the back door. Now, I didn't think anything of it at the time. But that, you know, half hour later, I thought about it. So, what was that? <laughs> and then I came home and went to the store one night. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. Right. And I came in the basement, and we had a dog. He was about six months old. And I... It was that size of a large cat walked by me towards the back door. <laughs> and I thought it was my dog. Right. Here was a sleep upstairs. 
and I had mentioned to my wife, and she seen the thing walking um, from the kitchen to the living room. So we asked the neighbors if they had a cat. Um, the guy lived there. He died, and his wife was so alive, but she got sick, and she moved into an apartment or whatever. Was it a cat? I think so, because we asked the neighbors if they had a cat, and they said yes. <laughs> okay. But it wasn't an evil feeling. It was like it was like they were checking us out and moving in their house. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, yes. cats do that. Yeah, it was like a ghost cat. It sounds crazy, but no, not crazy. Huh. If, if if you look, cats. Um, anybody who owns one, a cat or a dog, knows that they have individual personalities. And probably every bit as liable to come back as a ghost as a human. Yes. Can I have one more quick story? Sure. I used to work, work at a restaurant and at night. I used to wash the, the, the dishes or whatever. And I found this restaurant used to be a, 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 a marine base, and then a church, and then a restaurant. And it was a real late at night, and I was I was coming at, coming out of the uh, dish room, and I seen a figure out of the corner of my eye standing right about two feet away from me. And I turned and looked at him, and he, uh, you know, he wasn't there anymore. So I quickly got out of there real quick. <laughs> so, well, I would too. I have seen, uh, uh, thank you very much, similar figures, and you always see them in your peripheral vision. You just sort of halfway see them enough so you know they really were or are there uh, but they're not quite there when you when you focus your vision fully on them odd west of the rockies you're on the air hi hey Art, how you doing all right this is uh jim from santa fe yes sir i just wanted to share a little experience that i had all right back in my air force days it wasn't too long ago but uh I was stationed out at a base in California, and uh, every few years or so they have uh, an air show. And part of the air show is they've got these planes flying around and what have you, and they also have uh, some older jets uh, on display in one of the hangars, and it's open to the public. And, uh, you know, I didn't get to work that day, but I had to work a mid, you know, so I came in around, I don't know, 11 or 12. Sure. And, uh, you know, I uh, my duty post was, uh, you know, I had to, it out of this hangar. You know, I had an EAL, which is an entry authority list, and tells you who can come in and out of there. And uh, the guy I relieved told me, yeah, it was quiet. There's nobody in there, just the planes or whatever. And there's only a couple ways in and out of this hangar. So I go in there, and I'm, I'm looking around. You know, they had like F-4s and F-5s, some other uh, planes. And I was, right. you know, pretty interested in the ones from Vietnam. Yeah, some of them even had like bullet holes in them. And, uh, I took a flashlight and I went up to, uh, you know, to the undercarriage of an F4, and uh, you know, I was just looking around and uh, checking out the lights and the tire and what have you, and uh, I just kicked the tire, you know, just see how much air was in. I don't know why I did it, but uh, people always kick tires. Oh uh, yeah, especially when you're <laughs> bored. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I started walking away from it, and I heard this, like, tap, as if somebody was tapping on the glass. You know, uh -huh. I, I turned around, and I looked up, and, the, and in the cockpit, there was this, what appeared to be, like, somebody sitting in there. And it really spooked me out, because he had, it was wearing, like, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, like, Red Baron, you know, the, the goggles and the scarf and the, oh, yes. the cap? Sure. Guy was sitting there grinning at me, and I was like, whoa. You know, and I made sure there was nobody in there. And it, you know, really spooked me out. This was a Red Baron type in an F4? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it, you know, it really spooked me out. And you know, I didn't say anything to anybody until actually about two weeks ago. This happened about five years ago, and I talked to one of my friends. And... I'd be disinclined to tell that story myself. Yeah. That's, a, that's an amazing story. And so you just, what, took off? Oh, I couldn't take off. I just... Went back outside the hangar and called one of my friends who's on a roaming patrol to come over. And I just told him I felt really sick. Didn't tell him why, you know, until like <laughs> five years later. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I appreciate your story. Thank you. And while we're on the military subject, perhaps a correction, I don't know. Dear Art, my name is Jeffrey, and he gives a last name. I won't read that. And I also served aboard the USS Enterprise. 
One of your callers said the Independence took a torpedo hit. That is a Forrestal class carrier and has never taken enemy fire whatsoever, not even during Vietnam. The explosion, in fact, did occur and was caused due to a maintenance error, but the stories uh, he told are true. I've served on five carriers. The one I liked best was the USS Ranger. There, there was a ghost of a chief that wanders through the ship's galley. He was killed in a fire that broke out in the main machinery room, number three. So that may be a slight correction, but the story remains. Don't blame you for a second. Well, listen, we're out of time. We could go and go and go and go. Uh, if after listening to five hours of all of this, you don't believe we're more than flesh and bones, then you just haven't been listening. Uh, tell everybody good night. Good night, everybody, and sleep with your lights on. <laughs> I imagine a lot of people will be doing just that this night. That's Ghost to Ghost. I'm Art Bell from the high desert. Good night. I woke in the early morning to see someone kneeling beside my bed staring at me. I could see the outline, a smoking outline of a man, almost transparent, with an expressionless face. To my disbelief, I closed and opened my eyes, repeatedly thinking that I must have been dreaming, only I continued to see the figure kneeling and staring at me. Frightened, I threw two quick punches at my intruder's head. I have a black belt in karate, only to see my fists and arms pass straight through this entity as it slowly drifted back into the night. Obviously, I was frightened and confused. Was I dreaming? Earlier this week, I was again awakened in the middle of the night by someone or something grabbing at my wrist. So I shot up in bed and again saw the smoking outline of my visitor. This time it was holding my arm and staring directly at me. No time to react as the figure slowly simply faded into the dark again. Was I dreaming? Convinced this might all be in my head, I only told two of my closest friends about the ordeal. That, that was until last night. You see, I was at a school function sitting with many of my fellow students when the conversation turned to the supernatural that's when one of my classmates embarrassingly admitted that he and his roommate believe there is an entity visiting their apartment though they haven't seen the ghost apparently their visitor makes itself known by moving objects around the apartment and knocking other items over couldn't believe what i heard turned white as chills ran down my spine you must understand art the two students who told us that story live in the apartment across the hall, directly across the hall from mine. I don't know if I'm going to have time to get this in or not. It's from a police officer. Uh, he says, uh, here's my ghost story, Art. I'm a cop. When I was 13, we lived in an old church parsonage on the uh, Saline Seward County line in Nebraska, the church uh, and the small country cemetery was just south of the house. My bedroom was on the southwest corner of the house. One November night near Thanksgiving, I had just uh, turned out the light from reading. There was an earful moon out. I could see the church and the cemetery like uh, daylight. I lay back in my bed, which was inches from the door, as was the light switch was facing the door when I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I assumed it was my dad. It was not unusual for him to check on me. I like to stay up. He admonished me to get to sleep. I'd stay up and read. Uh, I heard steps coming closer, feigned sleep, but kept my eyes partly open. As the steps entered my room, I saw not my dad, but a shadowy figure. Tall, male. No features. I'll repeat, no features. It had a white collar. The moon uh, light in my room, almost like a nightlight, 
Should have been able to see any face if it was there, but it was just a shadow. I about filled my drawers. I walked toward the window, stood there as if uh, looking uh, at the church. It was a solid figure as the moonlight didn't shine through it. It turned, started back toward the door. Now me, I pulled the covers over my head and shook until I fell asleep. Several years later, when I was an adult, my dad and I were driving about having Barbie bops. We drove by the house, the church. I asked Dad if anything strange had ever happened there. My dad told me this story when he was, uh, when it was called, often when it was cold. We'd shut the sliding doors to the large parlor so we wouldn't uh, have to heat it. Dad would often wait to pounding on the sliding doors. They were taped shut. He actually on occasion would see the doors move as they were pounded on. You know, the old, uh, you've seen it in the movies, right? Boom, boom, boom. Door bows in, that kind of thing. Uh, so I know, uh, it just goes on and on. Uh, in other words, his dad had uh, uh, seen the same thing. I, I'm just, I'm, there's not going to be enough time for me to finish this story, but uh, uh, there's another case, you see, of an independent confirmation. As I said earlier, a lot of people think, you know, they see these things, they experience these things, and they don't want to talk about them for obvious reasons. And because somebody's, a, you know, you're afraid somebody will think you're nuts, right? Well, you're not nuts. And so tonight you will hear stories, and we're about to go to the phones from people who I can assure you. Most of them are not nuts. Now, of course, it could be a few, but most of them are not nuts at all. What's happening? Is real. A couple of these photographs, and one in particular, totally freaks me out. Again, on my website, artbell.com. What's new? Uh, second photo down at the moment. There's a woman coming right through a closed door, and, and and she's right in the middle of it. Now, this one, this one does it for me. You know, you hear the stories, and you will tonight, of people saying that these things come through walls and come through ceilings, but to get a photograph of it, <laughs> this one's really creepy, folks. All right, uh, here we go. First time caller line, you are first on Ghost to Ghost this night. Hello. Hey, Art. Hey. How you doing? Okay, where are you? I am calling from Chicago, WLS. Of course. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I was, let's see, I was doing an antique show in Texas, and on the way back, I went to visit my sister's house. It was uh, in St. Bernard Parish, right outside of New Orleans. Right. And so she was taking me on, like, a tour that most people don't go on, showing me interesting stuff. And she goes, oh, I got to show you this. I got to show you this. It's uh, the Lebeau Plantation House. We drove by it, and it's owned by a... Uh, fairly famous sugar company, any any grocery store that you would go into, you'd see the sugar packages. So they ended up buying up this plantation and, and the property they next. Right. And it's all boarded up. The place looks real spooky and everything like that. And she starts telling me the stories about this. And the first thing that I said after she, she started telling me this is, we have got to go in there. We've got, and she started laughing, going, ever since I moved here, I've been waiting for you to get down here because I've been wanting to sneak in. So in other words, you would intentionally go into such an environment. <laughs> as crazy as it sounds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. So you you and who went? Me, my sister, and my wife. Now, we're all adults, but we're yeah. all kids. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, right. I do. All right. So, so uh, a couple days later, it rained for a couple of nights, uh, so we couldn't do it. But a few days later, we got some good weather, and uh, we were armed with a, a towel and a flashlight. Yeah. That's good armor. Yes, towel and a flashlight, yes. And uh, it's funny because the people that are that, that live around here, if they're listening to the show, they'll know exactly what we're talking about. I should probably tell you the history of this place first. Well, I'd rather just kind of get to what happened. Okay. Um, well, we sneak. Uh, we we go behind VFW Hall, which is back behind this place, and we got to go a roundabout way to sneak over the fence and this, that, and the other. And it's kind of like right out of the next file episode, you know, going through sugar tankards in the middle of the night, stacked yeah. too high, and all this stuff. Yeah get into the house finally um and i'd like to say that we didn't really destroy anything except like a little eight inch board trying to get in but uh we get into this place and it's it's huge and there's like eight rooms on the bottom floor and 
So we start making our way around, and we're looking for a staircase. And you have to imagine that we're not supposed to be there. I understand that you did this voluntarily. So anyway, what happened? And also we're trespassing, and, you know, so we're more afraid of security than we are of ghosts. All right, I've got the picture. And so one of the first things that happened, and this was really bizarre, okay, because, you know, I'm pointing the flashlight down at the ground. I'm using the towel to kind of, like, block out the light so we're not lighting up an entire room at a time, but only a little bit so that we're not going to be seen from the outside. Yes. Now, my wife and my sister saw this better than I did. I saw it out of the corner of my eye, but they saw it. Just tell me what happened. A flashing light shot across the room, but, you know, like a swooping motion going upwards and then down and then back up again. Like in Ghostbusters. Yeah, it just shot across. Now, I only saw it out of the corner of my eye, and they saw it. So I, I turned out the flashlight because I'm thinking somebody's, you know, security's coming. They're flashing a light. Everything oh, yeah, like sure. Of course you wouldn't think that. So we're like, shh, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And we all go, we go stand by the doors, and, and, and we're looking out. The doors are boarded up, but, you know, there's places where you can see out, and we're looking to see. And we're like three, 400 yards from, from in any direction from anything. And? And, um... So we're just standing there being quiet, and then my sister goes, I just saw a light up in the, the, uh, the, in the through the floorboards in the ceiling above us. She goes, I just saw a light up there. And we get out, and, I, and, I, and I'm looking up, and then I see it in a different place. And there's, like, light coming through the floorboards, but yet there's, like, big holes here and there, and yeah. the holes weren't illuminated at all. Just, just little cracks of, of light. I mean, <laughs> not really, coming from everywhere. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Really, really bizarre. Okay, so then we go on, and I'm like, nah, 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 because you know, we, you're sitting there, you're saying none of this is happening. You know, you're just, you're just paranoid and all this stuff. And uh, so we go walking. Got about thirty seconds, sir. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we go around to the. We, we make the first pass of the first floor, and then we notice that we, we couldn't find the staircase. So we start going through again. The second time through, um, I this is the weirdest thing. We heard, I mean, this is like, it sounds like a classic uh, haunting type of thing, but I swear it sounded like, <laughs> you know, like a, a large metal handle door and it's it, something swinging closed. Yes. The wind started blowing, and everything's boarded up. But, and it dropped, like, we, we could hear wind outside, but it dropped, like, 20 degrees. And everybody just freaked, because we thought we were, once again, we thought we were busted. Not not that there were ghosts or anything. Okay, like. we're at about the end of the time here. Oh, uh, that's, that's a shame, because it gets better. Well, it's, it's going to have to do it real quick. Um, well, basically, I go over by the, 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 the end all be all is we heard uh, the, what sounded like the voices of, like, slaves calling like adult black men calling to and where, like, where, where, where was this again please this is in st bernard parish uh the lobo plantation house all right uh there was um uh there was a slave route uh when i lived in maryland once a place called blue ridge summit uh, we lived in a very large house uh, at the time. In fact, uh, the house we lived in, it was, my mom called it early Victorian uh, Halloween, <laughs> early Halloween. Uh, it, it was a, an old house, but it had 35 rooms, 35 rooms. And I, of course, I had appropriated one of the top rooms in the house for my ham shack. And it was on a route uh, where they had uh, sent slaves, you know, and they would send slaves from the southern part of the country to the northern part of the country. And there were certain, like, safe houses for the slaves, and this was one of them. And so we had in this house, it was a creepy house that I lived in. We had secret passageways, and so it was really cool as a child because, man, there were secret passageways that went around almost every room in the house. Totally secret passageways. Now, the story was they had been used uh, to hide slaves in their trek north. You know, it would be a stopping off point. But, man, that was one weird house I lived in. A place called Blue Ridge Summit of Pennsylvania, Maryland. The, uh, the Miss and Dixon line actually ran right through the house. Actually ran through the house. 
Amazing. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello? Yes. Oh, oh, hi. Yeah, this is Pat from Southwest Florida. Yes, Pat. Uh, I'm a retired New York City fire, fireman, fire New, lieutenant. New York City fire lieutenant. Oh, okay. That's correct, yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, and this concerns a story uh, regarding a ghost story that I heard. This is not a first-hand story, but uh, this week, uh, this um, was about Rescue One, which is which at the time was on 43rd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. Uh-huh. And the story was related to me by a, a firefighter at the time. This is about 1977. Can't remember the guy's last name. His first name was Chris. And if he's listening, he comes from Glen Cove, Long Island. Okay. But at any rate, uh, he told me this story that uh, on the second floor of this particular firehouse on 43rd Street, Rescue One, um, it's the bunk room. You know, on the first floor, you have the fire, you have fire truck and the kitchen and what have you. Sure. On the second floor, you have the, uh, the bunk room. And he said that uh, one night he went up there between uh, about 2.15 in the morning. And, he, you know, the, the, between, between runs, you know, you can go into the bed, you know. Can I ask a, stupid, can, can I ask a stupid question? Sure. Uh, Lieutenant, in those firehouses, you know, the old-fashioned thing was that there was this sliding pole between one floor and another, and you would, you would see firemen sliding down it. Uh, did that exist? Oh, sure, of course. Really? Of course, yeah. They had two of them in each house. In, in this particular house, they had two, one up front and one in the back. I always wondered if that was real normal or just sort of a media thing, you know. Oh, no, no, movies. that's absolutely true. It's, it's, okay, all right. Absolutely true. Yeah, okay. And after any New York City fireman, or any fireman, I suppose, for that matter, uh, they would certainly know this, you know. Oh, okay. At the time, I was assigned to Fort Truck, which, is, which was on 48th and 8th, uh, 48th Street and 8th Avenue. Anyway, uh, he told me this story, and he said that uh, this one particular night, um, he went up to um, into the uh, into the bed, and he was lying on his stomach. And by the way, this this particular bunk room is extremely dark, or it was extremely dark. Right. Pitch black. I mean, you couldn't see your, your hand in front of your face, and the only the only thing you could see was the luminescent light up on the wall, and. and um, he looked up and he saw it was about three o'clock or so, something like that. And uh, and then all of a sudden he felt a pressure <laughs> on his ankles, like somebody oh. grabbing his ankles. Oh, you know. Yes. And then they moved up towards his calves and so on and so forth, you know. Uh -huh. And he thought maybe it was one of the guys just, you know, playing a trick or you know, goofing on him, you know. Yeah. And he said, when a guy got up to the back of his thighs, he said, "That's it. I'm not putting up with this." Right. And he jumped up, and he turned on the lights in the bunk room, which was pitch black. And there was absolutely nobody there. <laughs> and everybody else was fast asleep. Yeah, well, this is part of what I've never uh, understood, and, and part of what I was after tonight. If You know, I can understand that there could be a ghost, or there could be a an entity of some sort, but how they actually physically manifest in this world... And, and and attack people and do things like you're talking about. That one I don't get. Well, uh, you know, I, I saw this guy twice afterwards, and I I said, Chris, I said, were you telling me the truth about that story? Right. And he said, I absolutely was. But let me let me tell you one. Let me go a little further with this. Sure. Okay. So the next morning, he got up and he related the story to the lieutenant on on, on duty that morning. Right. And uh, they, they, he said, hey, you know, something happened last night. It was really weird. And they checked the records, and it turns out that um, uh, something like 20 years before, like 19, I don't know, 1957, something like that. New York City Fire Department keeps long records. Huh? Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, okay. records back to the 1800s. So 20, oh, okay. So, so 20. anyway, they found out that at that particular hour and that particular date, uh, there was a fire a fireman in Rescue One who had was between tours. In other words, he wasn't on duty. Right. He was between tours. Right. They had a fire. This guy went to the fire between tours. He wasn't officially on duty. Came back to the firehouse. Went up to that particular rack, of that particular bed, and and died of a heart attack. Oh my God! Really. 
Uh, at the exact time, 20, yes. 20 years ago. Oh, yes. my. And it was documented. And, and from what he told me, the, the widow of the, of the firefighter, and I don't know his name, but the widow of the firefighter never received any compensation. So you know there was uh, so uh, well then you could imagine a motive perhaps for the haunting. Well, I don't know. Is that what, is that well, what you're knows? saying? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? You know, right. I, you know. At first, when I heard the story, I said, "Oh man, that's kind of hard to believe," you know. But you know, I, I, again, I told you I saw the guy and I said, "Chris, are, are you, is that really a true story?" He said, "I swear it was true." And P.S. Uh, Rescue One on Forty Third Street between Eighth uh, and Ninth uh, burned down. Around, uh, I'm not sure of the exact year. I think it was about 1979, 1980. It was a tremendous fire. It was on Daily News. Wow. But it burned down, and it, uh, it was a tremendous fire. It totally took the place out, you know? Well, for, oh, brother. Lieutenant, thank you. Okay. Take care. Uh, there's a fire, Lieutenant. You see what I mean? The part that I'm struggling to understand, and I'm, I guess I'm going to keep saying this, is... How do these entities that no longer possess a physical body manifest physical things? I mean, how can they be touching you, choking you, scratching you, affecting you physically in any way at all in this dimension? Remember, they don't have a physical body anymore, right? So how do these stories happen? How does it happen? Oh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello? Yes, sir. Oh, great. You're talking to me. I am, yes. Oh, all right. Where are you? I'm in Charleston. Okay. Uh, oh. Charleston, South Carolina. South Carolina. And I'm, I'm a police officer, and that doesn't make me more credible, I'm sure. But Yes, it does. Um, anyway, um, I have had numerous experiences with entities, and um, I would probably say in my lifetime, 30 years, I would say probably 10 or 15. Uh, and, how long have you been a, a police officer? About five years. Five years. I've right. had several on the job. But um, actually, the one I was going to talk about was what happened as a child. Fire away. Um, I'm not going to waste time or anything, but when I was a child, I was about um, six or seven years, and it was right after an experience that I had uh, two years prior um, with a miracle with a religious uh, person, okay? Okay. And we had moved into this new house, and everything that happened in this house was really odd. Um, I remember every Halloween, every um, really evil thing that went on. I, I remember, I don't remember Christmas or anything um, nice in that house. I'll make well, a long story give me any specific, you, uh, we don't have a lot of time. Well, make a long story out. short. I just went to bed, and I'd laid down. I was about six or seven years old, and when I laid down in bed, I turned my nightlight on, and I laid down, and my brothers had went to bed, and they... Um, once I had laid down, the um, I heard footsteps coming towards my door. And it's much like that other police officer had talked about. Oh, yes. Except the weird thing about this one was it wasn't a hazy glow or anything like that. It actually, it, it was, I call it a demon. But I had laid down. Well, I had be, not even closed my eyes. Could you actually describe what it looked oh, like? Oh, absolutely. What absolutely. It, what, and then do it. Tell what me. had happened was it stepped what, in my door. And tell, it was, tell me what it looked like. It was about six or seven feet tall. It was a figure of a dog, believe it or not. Oh, brother. And it was a, a demonic look. Um, it had hair. When I first saw Cujo, it had muddy, bloody, matted fur, just like Cujo had after right. he attacked all the people. And when it walked in, I smelled the odor of what I call pure death. If I ever smelled it again, I'd probably get sick. Um, it walked into my room. It looked at me, and it had bangs on the front of the on the bottom jaw that went straight up. You're a police officer. You yeah, know what, absolutely. You, you know what death smells like, though. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And um, but I, you know, I hadn't smelled that at six or seven years old. But and I've not smelled anything like it since. But and the top bangs went straight down had long fingernails and it came in it looked at me it walked towards my bed and the only thing I could think of to do was cover my eyes and start praying and which I did and it, it leaned over me and was uh, it. officer um, hold it right there we're uh, we're at the uh, top of the hour so sure. can you can you afford to hold uh, through Absolutely. the news 
Absolutely. All right, yeah, good. Hold on then, please. Um, does it make somebody more credible? Uh, is there a police officer or a fire lieutenant like that uh, previous caller? Yes, uh, because these are men trained in uh, observation. It's their job to observe and see what's going on and to observe it uh, accurately. So yes, of course, it adds some credibility uh, in that sense. I'm Art Bell from the high desert. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. Again, you're going to want to check out that picture on my website, second one down. Girl either walking through a door or right in the middle of a door, manifesting right through a door. It's totally creepy. We will be back. Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nine. Depends on how you listen to it. To be Coast to Coast to Ghost Coast, right? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. We are telling ghost stories. We'll get back to it in a moment. I'm told that Guam, which I think did before get through on the international line, can't now. So I don't know exactly what I'm going to do here. What I'll, I, I guess Guam, try to call my two regular... 800 lines, both east and west, because I'll be damned if I know which one you really are. And uh, on top of that, I once I clear the call on the first time caller line, I'll clear that number for Guam only for a period of time. We'll see what happens, because there are some good ghost stories to come from Guam, which is running the, the show actually live uh, this morning to them Saturday afternoon. The sun is probably beginning to sink in the sky now on Guam. Just sink, or maybe, no, actually, we wouldn't be sinking yet, I guess. Anyway, uh, Saturday afternoon, so we'll try it out here in a moment uh, with Bob. Sorry, you can't, it seems ridiculous that you can't get through on the international line being that far away, but uh, maybe that's the case. Stay right where you are. Ghost to Ghost AM continues. <laughs> to the uh, police officer, uh, and where are you again, sir? I'm in Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina. that's right, Charleston, South Carolina. I wanted to read this to you before you continue. Sure. Um, there's a man who writes from Wisconsin. Art, you know, it sounds like the policeman you're talking to had an encounter with Black Chuck, a spectral dog that has been reported all over the world, demonic, question mark, that it, it may have been a demonic thing, and he calls it a black shuck, a spectral dog, for whatever that's worth. Wow. You know, I've, I've always wondered what it was because I've always had experiences where I've actually seen figures. I've had doors bang. I've had a lot of things happen. Yeah, but this thing looked like a dog in about this thing. This thing was actually physically there. You know, and, and it wasn't in the spiritual realm. It wasn't It wasn't cloudy. misty. It you wasn't misty. It was in the physical thing. realm, and it tops my list as far as something that I could actually put my finger on, you know, and literally touch. If I had reached down, I probably could have touched it. But, you, of course, you don't know that for sure. I don't know that for sure, but the thing, the thing was is that it, it scared me to the point where I'd actually covered up and I started praying. And I was always wondering if anybody else had that an experience or if there was something in literature. Well, then maybe I just answered your question for you. you I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to do a little bit of research but, uh, on that myself. But the thing that really troubled me about the whole thing is I never spoke about it. I never told my family. I, you know, I'm the youngest of several bro two brothers. Right. You know, I never told anybody. And seven years ago, I was sitting there talking to my brother, and uh, the thing that shocked me, the whole situation, was we had uh, started talking about he's also a police officer. And I spoke to him about, you know, old houses. And he said, I didn't like this place. And I said, why? And he said, well, I had a problem there. And I said, what was that? And he described the creature to me. The same creature? The same, the same creature. And he said he was homesick and he was laying on the couch. And it, he described it to a T. And I interjected okay. us periodically so he knew that I knew exactly we both saw the same thing. Well, we both validated it that, to each other. That, uh, my friend, thank you very much. That's as creepy as it gets. Uh, to see something, uh, you know, perhaps demonic. I mean, you can always later sort of close your mind, right, and, and think to yourself, no matter how real the experience was at that moment, hey, I dreamed it, 
I had some, you know, some kind of hallucination. Something. But, uh... But when somebody else saw exactly the same thing, then your options begin to dwindle pretty far. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, Art. Hey. Okay, uh... Where are you? Oh, I'm in Reno. Reno, okay. This is you on KOH. And you're on a cell phone. Yes, I am. Okay. Okay, now, just bear with me here. When I lived in Colorado Springs, I was living in this house in the northwest part of town. And uh, it was a very hot summer evening. Well, probably about 8.30. I was sitting there watching TV. And we had this ghost there that just walked up and down the stairs. That's all it ever did. Just walk up and down the stairs. A ghost that you saw or just heard? Just heard. You heard the footsteps. Okay. When you came in the front door, there was a little foyer and uh, three steps into the basement and then like eight steps up to the living room. Okay. And it constantly walked from the basement up the steps and then back down again. Uh huh. So I got fed up. I lived in another haunted house a couple of years earlier and the ghost there was pretty friendly. So I said to this one, I said, was that all you can do? Just walk up and down, can't, you know, can you materialize? Can you speak? What? Yes, and I guess it considered that an invitation, right? Yes, it did. And, and did I what? Sitting, I was sitting there in a chair, and then all of a sudden, like I said, it's very warm evening, must have been in the mid-80s, had the windows open, and it walked right up next to me, and all of a sudden, I was freezing. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I got goose flesh. It was totally creepy and I felt this you know how you can tell when, like, when your wife's angry at you uh, and you I, know, oh, I yeah. seriously doubt <laughs> sure. I seriously doubt you don't experience that much but oh don't you kid yourself <laughs> <laughs> but you know you could feel the anger yes and I, I could just feel it and I was going oh jeez I'm sorry I said Actually, anything that's a you know? very very good analogy sir very yes. good every, every man out there and probably every woman, too, from the other side knows exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yes, I know that. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. And that's, that's the only thing that ever happened to that one. But in the previous house, we used to have windows fly open, doors fly open, lights go on, banging, pounding on doors. We yeah. called them Bob. Yeah, well, Bob. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't like the pounding on doors part. I did... Uh, <sighs> And that, and that goes to uh, a little of what I'm going to talk about right now. I don't rule this out. In fact, actually, I rule it in. A lot of strange things have occurred to me during the years that I've been doing these programs. And I'm becoming convinced, and you might want to uh, have this served up to you as a warning. I really am becoming convinced that when we talk of these things and we consider them, the more we do it, the more we invite it. And I think that's why I've had a lot of... One, one time during one of these programs, it wasn't a knock at my door. I mean, you've got to remember, I live inside, you know, a regular home, and, and, and I have my converted studio here. And what I heard hit my door was more like a pile driver. I mean, it wasn't a knock. Trust me, it kaboom! You know, that kind of thing on my door right during the, the middle of one of these ghost-to-ghost -ghost shows. And it scared the you-know-what out of me. I mean, right in the middle of the show. And I ran over to the door, uh, and I did open it. There was absolutely nothing there. But, I mean, this was a almost-going-to-break-it-off-the-hinges kind of kaboom on my door. So I've come to the conclusion that Elboro truck driver, and I get you on the S. I got an SM radio. I get you on the AS channel. Right. And uh, anyway, I team with my husband, so oh. we're coast to coast. Where? What part of the world are you in now? Right now, I'm in uh, Ludlow, California. Okay. And um, this happened in right outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, you got to understand, we're used to sleeping in different areas. Nothing's ever happened before. Sure. But we were outside of Albuquerque on uh, I-25 in a rest area. And you were up, you got a bunk up behind, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we got a sleeper berth. Right. 
and uh, this uh, happened uh, in a re in a rest area right at the 163 marker uh -huh. in Bellum, Bellum, New Mexico. All right. And I had just quit driving. I I had been listening to you like I always do, and I just quit driving. I was tired. My husband was already sleeping. So I put on my nightshirt and I was brushing out my hair. And um, so I turned everything off when I got done and I climbed in behind my husband like I normally do. Something kept telling me to look behind me. And I'm like, I'm not going to do this, you know. So I just closed my eyes, you know. And I'm not asleep yet because I had just laid down and it takes me a while to relax. All of a sudden, my body went totally numb. Now, this is, this is the God's truth. My body went totally numb. I could not move my body. This noise started coming out of my mouth. And I'm uh -oh. trying, I'm trying to speak. I'm trying to get my what, husband. What kind of noise? Like a gurgle, like a, it went like that. Yes. And my husband is still snoring. And I'm trying to move my fingertips to get him awoke because I can't hardly move, but I'm willing my fingertips to touch him. And I'm trying to get his name out. I'm thinking, am I having a stroke here? What's yeah. going on? Uh, right, you know? right. And that's what I'm thinking. But I'm like, no, that's not going, because my mind's working here. And all of a sudden, my body, I thought I was going to start levitating. I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? And I am start praying in my mind because my husband and I are very religious. And I, I start praying, you know, and finally, I don't know how, but I, my husband got awoke. But in the meantime, the middle part, because I'm keeping my legs and arms, trying to keep them down, but the middle part of my body starting to move up. I'm like, oh, please God, make it go away, please and God. And this is when your husband woke up? My husband woke up, he goes, what's going on with you? And I. And then it just, it just left. And, and, my and, and you, I, you just sort of flopped back down? I, I had already come back down. I didn't fully go up just because I'm, you know, just the middle part of my body's moving. Did you recognize anything that came out of your mouth? No, nothing but this noise. And like I said, I'm trying to go, damn, damn, like this, you know. Sure. Yeah, and you eke out his name, sure. Yeah. And so, you, and I'm thinking, is this one of these things where, you know, you're asleep, what do you call that? You're, you're, you think you're asleep, but you're not or something, you know what I'm talking? Of course. And, and I'm like, this ain't going on because I wasn't asleep yet. I was, I had just fallen in bed and something was telling me, turn over to my side and look. I'm like, oh no, this is too creepy. I'm not looking. I closed my eyes. So something, when, something. In Entered my body. Yeah, inhabited you, I was going to say, yeah, for a period nothing. of time. Yeah, and uh, now, and what was really weird when I pulled into this rest area, like when, when us drivers pull in late at night in the rest area, you can't find a parking spot. I hear you. I, I've, got a big, only, I've got a big RV, and I've, I've tried to fight for those spots, so I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, but see, and, there was only two other trucks there, and I'm like... This is strange. Tell me, tell me exactly where it was again. Um, okay, this was in, right outside, of, south side of Albuquerque. At mile marker one. One sixty-three. One sixty-three. All right. In all right, the well, rest area on uh -huh. twenty-five. All right, I got you. All right. Well, then uh, some other. Is, well, listen, we're out. We're out of time, but uh, some other truckers, I'm sure, will give mile marker one sixty-three a try because these things tend to hang out at the same place. All right, first time caller line is restricted for Guam, only Guam.
Kingdom of Nye from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. And the wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0900. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nye. I'll tell you what, I'm, after this next call, I guarantee, I, I've got a federal law enforcement officer on the first time caller line, and after that, I'm going to restrict it for Guam, uh, guaranteed. Uh, sorry you can't get through on the international line. That's, that's totally raw from my point of view. You should be able to get through on that line. But since you can't, and I know the 800 lines are swamped, the only option I have is to try and open the first time caller line for Guam only. So that's what I'm going to do as soon as I take this call. That number is uh, area code 775-727-1222. Once again, I'm going to hold that line open for Guam only. 775-727-1222. The only option I've got, I know, I know that Guam is with us right now on a Saturday afternoon. Stay right there. Hi, Tom Bodette from Motel 6. Welcome to Tom's Chat Room. Of course, the beauty of Tom's Chat Room is that Tom does all the chatting. So let's talk. Dearborn, Michigan asks, Hey, Tom, does Motel 6 really have the lowest rates of any national chain? Yes. And that's Tom's Chat Room. I'm Cyber Tom Bodette logging off for Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Motel 6 at a core hotel. Well, all right, let me say it one more time. Uh, following the call I'm just now going to take, uh, then I'm going to reserve this line away for only Guam. I don't, I don't care who you are, what it's about, only Guam. Those poor people. You would think, and, and if you're, if, by the way, if you want to call on the international line uh, and you're anywhere else in the world, you're welcome to now call because obviously Guam isn't able to use it. So the international line uh, anywhere else in the world is 800-893-0903 with reference to Guam. Uh, that This is going to mean you would have to pay for the call, but I, I don't know how else to do it. All these other lines are jammed beyond all reason. So if you're in Guam, seven, area code 775-727-1222, just as soon as I clear this line. And on that line, you're on the air. Uh, where are you calling f from, sir? Oh, you don't want to say, do you? No, not necessarily, if I can help it. You're, you're um, a federal law enforcement officer? Yeah, we're, and I can verify all this on, on, on the side if you want to ever get this information without being here. I, I understand, um, sure. I, we, uh, we're the federal officer that you see in the unmarked trucks that ride along the government property to keep people out where they shouldn't be. Okay. Um, I have two quick things to say. Uh, one, I had two experiences in my life. One recently and one when I was about 17. Um, we had a, oh, it was an old house in Detroit in an old area. And, uh, I was the only brave one out of the nine kids that lived in the certain part of the house that always had some strange happenings. And, um, Things got worse to the point where I started putting locks in the door. Well, one night I went to sleep and I woke up and my door was actually just ripped from the hinges. And you, nothing was missing, but I slept through that, which I'm, I'm a very light sleeper. You slept through your door being ripped off the hinges. With four locks on the door. because the, the, it was, And I never went to that part of the house again, ever. And exactly where, where, where did the door, door end up? I mean, was it on the floor? It was, or? It was, it was just ripped up and laid down right there on the floor. Okay. And, um... And recently, I was with another officer, and we were going to a closed area, an area where nobody should be whatsoever. Right. And we, we both went through the gate, and we closed the gate behind us, and we looked up in front of us, and he says, do you see what I see? I said, yeah, there's something up there. We got the truck, and we gunned it, and it, either this person could run about 70 miles an hour, or they just got away from us. And we were in an area where you can see everything within about four square miles. <laughs> but um, it's strange that two people can see the same thing, and we both looked at each other and says, we got him. No, it's, Chase, it's not Whatever strange. it was, the shadow ran in front of us. It was right early, early in the morning, before sunrise. It ran in front of us for probably about maybe, oh, I'd say a good four or five hundred yards. It was about 
Oh, uh, about a thousand yards in front of us when we went through the gate. And you're trying but, to tell me this thing had to be moving at 70 miles an hour? Yeah, because I, I guess, I mean, I, we were going to get this person or whoever it was and find out what they were doing in this area. And um, the, we were looking at each other like, we can't believe this is happening. Boy. And finally around the corner and there's nobody there. And I, um, I, I, I don't know what see. to tell you. I, I really appreciate your story. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, I, we love listening to you guys out there. Believe it or not, we, we listen, a lot of us listen to you. Thank and you. And you guys really entertain us through the night and keep, keep up the good work. I do believe it. Thank you very much, sir. All right, that clears that line. Now, only Guam on that line. See, I, I've got the feeling it's the only way I'm going to get Guam through here tonight. Now, there's yet another law enforcement officer. Oh, well, these fellows work at night. You know, they work at night and... Uh, uh, many times they work in pairs and they are trained observers. So, yeah, you give them a little more credibility. Stuff is happening uh, everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, is that me? That's you. Oh, okay. Uh, I lived up at a place called, uh, can I say the name of the place? Well, I don't know. It depends on... Is it like a hotel or... Well, no, it's or, the area is uh, known for the world's biggest fig tree. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I mean, lead... No, that's okay. You can tell me where you live. Oh, it's a place called Fig Springs. In what state? Uh, Arizona. Arizona, okay. Yeah, it's near Cayman. All right. Um, it's, there's a lot of legends about the area itself, but uh, one particular night, my uh, mother and a, a friend of ours were up there and we're just... Uh, hanging out in the main trailer that we we care took my parents care took the land for uh, for the people who owned it and we're just talking about different stuff uh, as the uh, night time and I started getting really nervous I was pretty young at the time started getting very very nervous about like I am now as a matter of fact <laughs> um, and uh, the the other Two people are, were with us, my mom and the other person, were also getting nervous, but they were trying to pretend like everything was okay because they didn't want to scare me. I looked back behind me, and I see a guy sitting, lying on the bed in the living room. We're in the kitchen. She could see in the living room. There's a bed there. And he was floating about a foot off the bed. Oh and I, about that time, I uh, said... Uh, the, the people, the, my mom and the other person, I think we should leave now. <laughs> well, so, describe this as best you can, floating, you said. Yeah, he was just, he was just lying there nonchalantly like, oh, nothing to worry about. Just kicking back uh, on the bed, except he wasn't on the bed, he was above the bed. But in yeah, But what I'm trying to get at is in every other way, fully materialized... Uh, he was uh, partly see-through. He wasn't totally solid. Uh-huh. Yeah. It, he was, like, partly there, partly not type of thing. I've seen a lot of ghosts before like that. And this... Well, if you get a chance to check my website, you'll see a picture of a lady halfway through a door. And when I say through a door, I don't mean walking through a door. Yeah. I mean, I mean oh, yeah. coming through a door. Okay. I'll ch be sure and check that out. But anyhow, I, we decided to gather. But by, by the way, uh, there were people hung on that uh, fig tree there uh, before it was originally chopped down. But anyhow, uh, we left the building and started going down a hill. It was pretty dark out. We're going down this hill to head to where we stayed in a small travel trailer. And we hear a noise like a clunk, clunk, clunk noise behind us. And um, we look, tried to look back, but we couldn't see what it was. And we, we just took off running. All of a sudden, I freeze. I look back, and I see way up in the sky. I look straight up. I see in the sky what looks like a small piece of metal, uh, maybe two foot by three foot piece of metal. Yes. And like a small uh, uh, tin or aluminum uh, garbage can flying in the air. Really? It makes a circle around me, and I hear a crash behind this uh, one little uh, rock shed that was up there. Uh, I was frozen on my spot, so one of the other people had to grab me and pull me in the trailer. Um, we all compared notes and found out that we were all kind of, uh, feeling kind of weird vibes and everything about the area. Uh, when we were in there. So the next day, since it was too dark to go out that night, the next day we went out and looked to investigate to see what it was. The clunking noise behind us was actually a tin garbage can. 
But the two pieces of metal I saw up in the sky, I mean, this is Arizona. We don't get tornadoes that often here. Yes, that's and the right. ground wind was not... Um, it was not the uh, it was not that bad. It so was, what are you saying happened to you? I mean, what it are you... Was, this piece of metal was about the size of an average living room. It was two pieces of metal, and what it was was a, <laughs> a roof off of a porch shed that was at the trailer. Oh my God! Um, after after having told the story to several people, uh, we found out that the trailer that that was had happened in. Someone had gotten shot by the police. Then they had escaped from uh, something. They they ran from the police and they got sh and he got shot in there. And the person told us, "Well, we can prove it. Go look by the back door and you'll see bullet holes there." And so we went and looked by the back door. There weren't, weren't any bullet holes, but there was some pieces of duct tape. We started looking under the duct tape, and sure enough, there's bullet holes. There's bullet holes. Oh, yeah. brother. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you <laughs> Uh, you see, ghosts uh, seem to manifest themselves uh, most frequently from those who either die unexpectedly, die in the middle of a passionate love affair, uh, commit suicide, hang themselves, blow their heads off, that kind of thing. Those type of deaths, uh, you know, violent deaths, seem to bring this sort of thing. Why, I don't know. It may be the speed of the death, but, you know, if that was true, then you would think that most people that got hit by trucks or walked out into the middle of traffic would be ghosts as well, wouldn't you? And yet it appears to be this, uh, this hand of man violent death whether it be one's own hand or another hand that produces the entities that stick around. So f go figure. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. 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 Yes. Yeah, hi. This is this is Mark from St. Louis. Hello, Mark. Um, I was listening to your show when I heard uh, one of the police officers call, and he had a story uh, about... He, he called it a demon dog. Oh, the dog-like creature, yes. Right. Okay, well, I got a story similar to that, only it's not a, it's not a dog, but um, it, uh, it has similarities. Uh, when I was a, a, a kid, um, I grew up in a family of, of, I was the youngest of five, and I was sharing a, a bedroom with my sister, who was the second youngest for me. I was the youngest. She was the next one up. Right. And uh, so I was, I'm going to say maybe, um, gosh, I don't know, seven or eight years old the first time I saw this thing. Yes. Uh, it, it's a very distinctive memory for me, and it, it's hard for me to even talk about it without getting the chills. Uh, I was asleep, or, or not quite yet asleep. I was in bed. My sister was, uh, her bed was in the corner of the bedroom farthest from the door my okay. bed was uh closest to the door right um it was dark it was nighttime i i have no idea I'm trying to remember how late it was but that i know doesn't matter. Uh, go ahead. yeah everybody in the house was asleep um the lights were off and i saw something come through the bedroom door at, at first now when you say come through the bedroom door do you mean like now? your picture only only this had no definition on that picture on your website oh you've you, seen have you seen that picture yeah you could make out eye sockets and things on your picture i mean oh my god that thing is i almost in, thought that door looked like there was something superimposed it's so uh, because it's either i mean in that the door, door changes color it's I mean. either in that door or coming through it so this was similar to that, okay, now I'm in a dark bedroom, and I don't know how I can accurately describe this, but I'll give it a shot. Um, there's such a thing as uh, darker than, or blacker than night, okay, yeah, and that, yeah, that, sure that, that, that's the best way for me to describe this thing, because your eyes will gradually adjust to the, to even a dark room. That's correct. And uh, so I, I thought I see something really, it, it was like a black void is the best way I could describe it. Okay. Um, it was no, no, no dimensions. It was just a black void. Yep. Um, it was about uh, where, where somebody's head would be, that, that high up on the door. And I, I remember squinting my eyes and, and opening them again and thinking, you know, what that what the heck is that? Sure. And uh, I'm looking, and it, and it starts coming through a little bit more. And what it was, it was this thing's head. Okay, and it was it, it poked its head through just a little bit, and on the side of its head, I saw on the side of its head, I could see like 
again, blacker than black, wispy arms coming through, like the hands were, were being extended, and they were coming through the side, you know, from the side of the head. Okay, and, okay. and the head comes in farther, and it looks around in the room. And I'm, and the whole time I'm thinking, am I just, you know, am I seeing things? Am I imagining this? Yes. And the more and more I look at it, I'm getting scareder and scareder, and I, it, it, it's taking on a form. And my, my sister's asleep, and I'm just, I'm, I'm getting scared to death seeing this thing. And it's, and it finally comes through the door, floats through the door all the way. I could see it was smooth shaped, um, meaning it, it didn't look like it had wild hair or anything. It was completely black, but the head was round, let's say like a mannequin's would be. Okay. And I remember seeing arms and a torso. Uh, you know, I'm peeking through my covers. I got my covers probably like up to my nose at this point, you know, looking at this thing. And the way I, I, I'll never forget the way it moved. It was like a burglar was like he would move like you, if he was tiptoeing, he was, it was very like almost stalking the room with sure. his head crouched down and the, and the arms were kind of up in the air and the arms, there were really no hands. It, it just kind of ended in long tendrils. Well, you know, uh, long tendrils. This sounds classically like a, a shadow person story. It, it, exactly. And, and you, it, you describe it as blacker than black. That blacker than black. Something and that would be uh, black within a totally dark room. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and, and there's something I want to describe here because I think this is just as important or prominent as, as the actual seeing it. Sure. There was, an, and I'm, again, this is from a kid, so uh, seven or eight years old, I felt a presence of evil like you would not imagine. I, there was no way even at that young age did I think this was a ghost. I mean, I was scared out of my, you know, my, my shorts. I, to me, this thing uh, was not a spirit of somebody that had come back. This thing was... I'm thinking this thing is from hell or something coming up. Well, that's that. You know, uh, that that is why. Uh, again, folks, that I'm saying. You know, we call these ghosts, but that's just a name. We don't know for sure what they are. In some cases, they may be the departed uh, managing to manifest back in on the earthly plane here, right? Uh, but they might not be human either. Many of these things may not be human. And so I'm tending toward the physical manifestation, particularly physical attack type stories, so I can try and get a better grasp of what it is that we're dealing with here. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I, I want to reiterate uh, that because of the screw-up, and apparently Guam can't get through on the... Uh, the international line. I am going to hold this first-time caller line open for Guam only. All right? I know you're out there this afternoon trying to get through, so keep trying. It's area code 775-727-1222. And, of course, the lines are totally jammed, but if I need the audience to cooperate, do not call that number. Let Guam get through, please, on that number. Guam only. Area code seven seven five seven two seven one two two two. Otherwise, use any other line. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Hi. We don't have a whole lot of time before the top of the hour, yeah, sir. Let me do this real quickly. All right. Uh, I'm a retired sheriff's captain. Yes, sir. One night, the the uh, dispatch supervisor uh, ran out of paper in her computer and wanted me to go with her into the courthouse to retrieve some paper. She would not go there alone. This is an old western courthouse in which the, the jail was in the basement. A number of people had been hung there and killed themselves there, and she was scared to death of it. Right. We went up to the front door, which was a double double glass door, and unlocked the door. And when I opened the door and put my, I had a flashlight, I didn't want to turn the lights on. And there's a, a, a set of stairs, and at the top of the stairs, you like cats, you'll enjoy this. There was a ghost cat standing there. And when I when I shine my light on it, he he reared his back up like cat will, and hissed at me, and 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 attacked me. Ran down the stairs and what? ran at me. Ran up my body. What? And and according to the dispatcher, uh, went through me. What? I didn't, see the, I didn't I didn't see the cat go through me. She said it went through me. She saw it come out the back end of me. Holy uh, moly! When I it it, it shocked me. 
so bad. I just lost my composure there for a minute. Uh, I dropped my flashlight. I picked oh. the flashlight back up, and I had to turn it back on, and I, I shined it up to the top of the stairs, and there was a man standing there, a, a ghostly-looking man, and he just slowly, slowly dissipated and went away. <laughs> uh, huh. I, I don't know what to say about that. This, this cat, this cat was, uh, this cat just scared me to death. I mean, it was not, it was not a physical cat. It was a, it was a, uh, she, she told me that from that day forward, she'd never go back in there again. And she said that was the first time. I don't blame her. I, I wouldn't do it either. Uh, I, in fact, I'd probably quit. Go find another job or Let, transfer or something. Listen, I got to go. We're, we're okay. up, up here at the top of the hour. I appreciate your call. Thank you very much, officer, and take care. So many law enforcement officers, uh, people who are trained to observe things. A cat that attacks and kisses, arches its back, attacks you and jumps right through. Ay, ay, ay. That's it, K-57. Yep. Well, I guess it's, what, a Saturday evening there by now, huh? It is. The The sun is now starting to uh, set. Actually, it's starting to go down now. Okay, all right. Uh, well, what's up? Well, um, I'm really sorry that uh, True Tomorrow didn't get through here first. Um, <laughs> it, hopefully more will come in. Um, ghost stories are, or spirit stories uh, might be more accurate, are very much a part of the culture here and are experienced uh, very regularly um, on island they're usually referred to as the Tautamona which I believe um, it literally translated means the original ones um, oh isn't that interesting I, I lived on Okinawa for 10 years and that was a very very haunted island there's something about islands huh I, I, yeah yeah yeah, well, and there's there's quite a certainly 
a lot of violence has taken place here and on this That's island so and um, and probably on Okinawa as well. You, you were mentioning earlier you didn't use the word violence, but... Um, oh, no, there was yeah. a lot of violence there. So, People were burned in caves on Okinawa. Sure, and uh, not much different here. It's kind of scary. But um, there's also um, something called the Duendes, which is really more... It's a breath out. It was so intense. And I couldn't believe this was happening to me instantly, like the last caller who said that he prayed to Jesus and he tried to get something, mm. nothing happened. Mm. Well, that wasn't the case for me. I, I prayed to Jesus and, and I prayed to the Lord and I asked them to cast whatever it was out of my room and it took no longer than 10 seconds. It felt like an hour. And it smelled, re it sm it smelled really bad. Like rotten eggs. Like, like rotten eggs. eggs. Okay, well, uh, we're going to dub that one the Mr. Hinky Monster. It hovered over him and it was foul. <laughs> That's actually scary stuff, you know. I mean, it's really scary stuff. What are these things? What are these things? West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, um, I have an entity attack story. You too, huh? I mean, yeah. I, I've got this special entity attack line, and you're, you guys, have, there's so many of them, you're leaking into my other lines. Okay. Well, you know, it's amazing to think, though, that how common I think it actually is. Apparently. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, um, well, I have a theory on, on what happened, but first let me tell you what happened to me. Sure. Okay, when I was about eight, probably about eight years old, I remember I was at a house that I was living at with my grandparents and my father, and, uh, his ex-wife <laughs> to me. Well, I was in the room, okay, and I was scared, you know, just basically because of the dark. I didn't like sleeping in the dark. But mm -hmm. So then my dad left the front door or the bedroom door open with the hall light on so that I wouldn't be quite as afraid. Well, mm -hmm. I, I began to lay down, and uh, I remember I was still, you know, kind of scared, and I laid there for a while, and, and I remember feeling afraid still, but I, I hit my head under the covers, you know, like kids do. Oh. Well, but yes. I was too afraid to go to sleep. So I know I was 100% awake. And I felt a presence, like I have through my life at many times, actually. But I felt this presence. And I was on a bunk bed. And I was on the top bunk. Mm -hmm. And whatever this was, uh, of course, I believe it was a spirit. Well, it, it pushed me on my chest. Now, when it pushed me on my chest, it didn't just, like, push me in. You know, I felt a push. I mean, it pushed me. Uh, and and if what, I, so if I'd been on the bottom bunk, I would have seen this this <laughs> giant indentation forming, right, as, as yeah, it pressed you toward me. Uh, hmm, and right. you would have also heard the thump that came when I bounced off the bed and uh, hit the ceiling um, directly you, from it. And You hit the ceiling? I hit the ceiling? ceiling because it was really close to the ceiling anyways, and it was a pretty bouncy mattress. But when it pushed me... And I bounced, and I hit the ceiling. Yeah. I remember I was so frozen with fear, you know, and I could barely, like, yell. But when I finally was able to, man, I, I, man, my dad, he knew I was, like, scared. So he came in there, and I told him something pushed me. And when I told him that it hurt my chest, and so he opened up my chest. And, you know, it's funny with all the stories I, uh, that you've had on your program. Yes, sir. Of people saying that there are handprints and things. Well, sure enough, I had two handprints on my chest. Oh, and, brother. Which is weird, you know, because it's like... But anyway... No, it's so, not weird because it verifies what you just said. Uh, what did your dad say? Well, my dad and my family, I mean, I, I don't mean to sound, you know, like everybody's got their ghost stories and stuff, but my family, we've been very uh, very open to these types of occurrences, but, you know, it's like... Uh, yeah, but I, you know, I'm not going to say these aren't ghosts because who the heck really knows. Exactly. But... But I think I do. I, I do know that they are personally from within, but that's just something different. I, I myself... Oh, you, you know, believe from within, you know, the, the monster of the id. In other words, you created this thing yourself? Well, my perception itself of its existence. Like, in other words, why would it actually have the ability to physically assault somebody if it's not physical? Oh. I believe it's because of the awareness of what it wants to do. And sometimes if you are fearful like a child often is... Yes then it preys on fear, and that which is of fear becomes and manifests into physical. See what I mean? Well, yeah, I see exactly what you mean, and I, I, I think that uh, that's entirely possible, that the amount of fear uh -huh. is well, actually emotion. able, or an emotion is, is able to 
generate that which is feared. Uh, it builds on itself and it feeds on itself and you create it. Yes, exactly. That's as good an explanation as any. And, and perfect love, you know, it's been said in the Bible, you know, not that I'm a Bible thumper, but, you know, it's like I can see validity in all religions by faith I'm a Christian, but I couldn't see Jesus giving Buddha a black eye, you know. But uh, I, I think without a doubt, hands down, that perfect love, as it says, casts out fear, but I think perfect love comes through being wise through the years, right? And basically through growing as a human being. But when you're a child, you're naive and you're, you're sensitive to these things. And that's why it comes to children a lot. Can you know, can you know perfect love without having experienced perfect fear, perfect anger, perfect depression? You know, in other words, can you understand perfect love until you've been the other place? Well, you know, believe it or not, my personal feel on that is that when you actually feel perfect love and, and, and when you experience it and you find it, of course it does come through rising above not being perfect. But <laughs> see, rising above not being perfect has to come through serious pain. Uh, pain yeah, yeah. is uh, the medicine of the soul. That's what I think too, sir. Thank you very, very much for the call. I just don't think you could know it uh, and uh, certainly not appreciate it unless you had experienced uh, the opposite. On my entity attack line, you are on the air. Hello. Uh, yeah. I'm Richard in uh, Houston. Hi, Richard. Uh, about uh, 1979, um, I was uh, sleeping here beside my wife. Mm -hmm. I woke up, something was pushing me down onto the mattress. And I couldn't see anything. I could see the ceiling and all. Mm -hmm. And I was desperate. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't yell. I tried to yell, and uh, all that came up was a little bitty squeak on my voice, and I was frantic. Was it? it was it like hands? Uh, oh, it was a weight on my entire body. All right. So an overall weight. Overall weight. Okay. And I struggled. I struggled. I struggled harder, and I was getting desperate for breath. And uh, I must have struggled harder. Something it just gave up because when it when it quit, when it let up, the mattress rose an inch or two, <laughs> and then it was gone. And if, I you, if you had not struggled against it, uh, what do you think would have happened? I have no idea. I was in a panic. Well, I'm sure you were. Uh, but uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't consider what, what might have occurred. Well, no. Uh, you mean let it give an end to it? Well, or not. Just not struggled. Uh, perhaps somebody else might have imagined they couldn't struggle against something like this, and they would have just submitted. I don't know. I know it was heavier than I am. I weigh, I weigh 200 Oh, oh, oh. So, oh, by the way, yes. can I mention one more thing? Yes. That sound you have with a Bigfoot? Yes. That's not a Bigfoot. That's a U.S. Navy sonar. Well, people now, are... How do I know? People, well, yeah, but how do I know is it more important? I know question. the sound. I'm a retired chief sonarman, and I heard uh, that sound I've many, heard this. I, believe me, I've heard this, but we, we have a providence on the sound, sir. In other words, uh, we know who recorded it where they were in the woods, uh, not under sea. A lot of people have said it sounds like sonar, and I understand that it does sound a little bit like that. But uh, trust me when I tell you we have the providence on this tape, and uh, uh, that, that it is not uh, sonar. We know who recorded it and where. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Art? Yes. Well, I, you cut me off on the other line, but I have an attack story, but I, I wasn't alone. I had someone with me. What do you mean? Well, I was with my girlfriend in the desert, and this happened in March of 1993. And what happened? Well, uh, I was observing some lights about 100 miles away coming, uh, coming from the south, going due north. Uh, looked like it was coming from San Diego up over Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. And um, I observed this for about 10 minutes. I called my girlfriend's attention to this. We were, we were camping out near 29 Palms. Right. And uh, I did my last year and a half in the Navy at Top Gun. There's so many aircraft flying around down there, it's sure. hard to keep track of them. Sure. This one got my attention, and I couldn't tell you exactly why, but... Um, and this sounds bizarre, but I've never told anyone this story. Well, we've got less than a minute, so... Well... I'm dying to know if there's other people that had something like this happen. But this ball, this yes. light ball, came out of this large craft 
and it came right up in front of us, about 48 inches away. It was about the size of a basketball. It was extremely brilliant. looked like the end of a sparkler. And it literally, I could feel it scan my brain quickly. And then it went to my girlfriend, and it spent some time with her, and then it left. It was shot up into the sky and went back to this large craft. She was very traumatized by this and spent about eight months in therapy. Boy, that's some story. Um, and you, you sound okay, huh? Well, we were frightened to death. We I know. I, I believe me. I understand. All right. Th thank you very much. From a craft, a ball of light scanning the brain, and then wonder what it did with the information that it downloaded from you. Apparently. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM. Some of the fast blasts that I'm getting tonight, Shelley in California writes, I was attacked by a spirit who plunged a butcher knife into my pillow and then told me what he wanted. Shelley, you should fast blast me your phone number. No one else will see it, just me. And I'll call you and we'll get that story on, on the air. So if you have a similar story, and it's, it's really a, a very, very good one, you know, you, you can fast blast me a phone number, and I'd be uh, more than happy to get hold of you. In the meantime, the lines are jammed, so the odds of any single person making it through are, you know, somewhat slim. On my entity attack line, you are on the air. Hello. Hello there. How are you doing? I'm, well, I'm okay. Good, sir. Um, Mr. Paul calling from KSTE. Uh, Sacramento, Sacramento, right? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I'm a... Assistant pastor in church, six feet nine, three hundred seventy pounds. You are six feet nine, three seventy. Yes, sir. Ay, ay, ay. So and you're not like a bouncer for the church, right? Oh no, sir. Oh, okay. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened, sir. Even I don't believe it, but it happened. Matter of fact, it happened this year in March. I was in bed sleeping. Next thing you know, of course, I have a specialized California king size bed to sleep in. Uh huh. I'm so big. Uh, however, um, it went through, right through the door, that entity. It went right through the door. I'm looking right at it, and it's coming right towards me. And just about, I'm getting ready to leap on it, because I thought it was someone who, you know, broke in the house. Yeah, of course. And when I looked at it, I said, whoa, no face. No face. It's like... Um, That's bad. Yes, very bad. No face. It wasn't walking. It was gliding towards me. Gliding, another bad sign. No hands. Real bad. And it said, I'm going to get you. <laughs> oh, man. I said, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get me. Oh. And, he, and all of a sudden, it stopped. It reversed, floated. Went, you see, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm not going to get you, I'm going to get your wife. He went towards my wife, grabbed her uh, ankles, Throw her off the bed onto the floor. It hit her head and whole body hit the floor. Big loud thump. God. Immediately I got up and I wanted to just, of course, beat the hell out of whatever it was. Immediately, uh, as soon as I, I turned the light on, it was gone. And your wife? And my wife, on her um, ankles, she's a very light skinned woman. Right. And there was two marks, I should say not two, but two hand imprints, eight in, in total. And um, a little like imprints of a hand. And immediately, we're looking at it, up her, this is on the ankle now, up, going up from, from the ankle towards her middle, inner thigh, it started to bleed. This, this, this skin started to bleed. Immediately, of course, I applied pressure on it and stopped. Was there a physical cut, you know, a reason for the bleeding, or was this just blood through the skin? Uh, this is just a blood coming from and through the skin. No cut at all. Holy moly. And it's amazing because, remember, it's happened in March of this year. Yes. I'm a heart patient. 
A, a month later. You're lucky to still be alive now. That's correct. A month later, I was in the hospital uh, in San Francisco, and um, the same thing happened to me again. On my post be there for a couple of days, I was there for three weeks in the hospital. What happened was on the third night, my heart stopped. Wow. Yeah, it just stopped. I didn't know it stopped. Because uh, immediately off to the right, there was the same entity again. It reminded me of um, the headless, um, what's it called? Headless, headless horseman? Yes. Uh-huh. I mean, nothing. I mean, the hood. The hood. Oh. No, no face. Just, and it said, it's time to come with me now. I looked at him. I looked at him. I said, I'm not scared of you, wherever you are. And I'm, I'm not coming with you. Immediately, it said that it was coming towards me. Yeah. And then, automatically, the nurse or the doctor was putting uh, those two, what's called us stuff to... Uh, paddles? Yeah, paddles on my chest. Immediately, I, I woke up. And it, I said, what, what happened? They said, uh, uh, I went, to, went into heart failure, and my heart stopped for the last eight seconds. Holy oh, smokes. Hey, uh, listen, um, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I am curious. Yes. What kind of life have you led? Afterwards? Well, no. No, no. Previously. Uh, what type of life? Yeah, in other words, uh, well, let, let, let me sort of lay it out this way. It seems as though mm -hmm. uh, at critical moments you're having encounters with, with folks that um, aren't likely to lead you to the up escalator. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, I'm just kind of curious what kind of life you led. Oh, uh, got married, uh, wow, a year out of college. I'm 40, 45 years old now. Uh, went from, I played professional football for one year. Had to stop because of the heart. I was born with a heart, heart problem. Who did, you, who did you play for? Uh, Seattle, Seattle. You, you played for the Seahawks? Yes, sir. And then, from, after I got waived, I wife is from Hawaii. So I, I went to Hawaii, and I got hired over there on a, on a uh, very prominent bank over there. I stayed there for the last, uh, wow, 18, 19 years. Let's get back recently. Again, the heart started to act up again. That's why I had to get out of that banking environment. Uh, I was uh, I left as senior vice president of the bank. Their banking's probably as bad as professional football for the heart. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but uh, it's just, again, uh, I've been listening to the program the last 15 years, and, and I, I was declined to call because uh, this, this, this is true. I, I, I can't believe it. I mean, it only happened once. It happened twice. And it's very, very, very... Uh, not, not, I wasn't scared. It's just my wife is... Petrified. Would, have, would have done the trick for me. Uh, what, what's it like listening to other people with, you know, somewhat similar stories? Well... It must be strange. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people think this only happens to them and maybe in the movies. Oh, no. Uh, again, I remember I used to be an assistant pastor in the church. Right. Had to stop because of the heart. Uh, I heard many, many stories in the church. I went to a um, went to a with a Catholic um, past, um, I'm sorry, what's called those guys? Uh, I'm, could have been a bishop. Yeah, it could have it could have been uh, about five years ago to help assist him exercise a person. And I, 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 my wife firmly believes that that whatever it was 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 probably following me because the person. It took about a long time to get that entity out of the particular individual, and uh, it was it was very very um, nerve wracking because it takes a lot of years to go through this training. And uh, at the time, uh, again, I had the heart problem. Well, I hope uh, in the future, any future crisis you have brings uh, something a little brighter. Uh, to, to, you know, to light your way, my friend. Thank you so much for the call. Oh, you're welcome, sir. Uh, you take care. Wow. You just, you know, you never know. I mean, when you open up these kinds of lines, you never, you never know what you're going to get. And uh, we're, we're definitely getting our money's worth tonight. I 
had no idea that there really were so many, uh, there are so many of you out there that have been attacked in such a violent way. It's astounding. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah, I went to Job Corps uh, back in the uh, early 80s and met a guy that uh, told me stories about how him and his family were severely attacked by demons all the time and that uh, his little brother and stuff would end up with black eyes and and uh, just bad luck all the time. I mean, it was horrible the way he described his life. They'd be like driving out of the parking lot and the wheels would fall off their cars and just numerous accounts of, of just horrible uh, encounters with different uh, type of uh, entities in their home and stuff. And uh, we were talking one night and uh, all of a sudden, out of the blue, right up in the little corner of the room, it was like there were tens of thousands of angels in a circle looking down on us. It was like all these eyes were just beaming down on us. Yes. And I know this sounds really freaky, but I'm telling you, at the same time, we both seen it, and just chills just went up and down our body. And uh, it was the most frightening thing. I mean, it was frightening, but in another sense, it was kind of... Uh, uh, maybe that was a circle of protection. It may have been, but I tell you, uh, and when I was, me and my brother were children, we used to get visited by this woman called the Dostal Woman. She used to climb down out of the attic from the closet. She and she, then, she lived or, or appeared in, she lived in that closet, you believe? Yeah, she came down in, out of the, the attic, attic every night. Every night? Yeah, and she would look at us and stuff. She was a dark figure. And, I mean, you, you talk about two scared kids. We were horrified. Our hair would stand up on the back of our necks and just goosebumps all over us. And we would try to scream, and you couldn't get nothing out, you know, because you're so horrified. And uh, What did she want? I don't know. Uh, we told our mom and dad about it, and our mom... Uh, she kind of believed us, but our dad, you know, he, he always was real skeptical. He didn't believe anything. And one night it sounded like somebody was setting the uh, table in the dining room with uh, knives, forks, spoons, plates, just like somebody was setting the table. Right. Like about 2.30 in the morning. Yes. And my brother and I, we were petrified, you know, because we had this room right off the dining room. And my mom and dad were at the, in the front of the house. And we were witnessing all this stuff, and we could see, like, two legs, white legs. Uh, do, you, do you know what I mean, like the pajamas of the old, old-fashioned old pajamas? Sure. Yeah, with the, like, lace around the bottom? Sure, sure. Now, now, we would see two legs jumping over the table, back and forth, and then walk around the table, uh, and you could hear plates and stuff being set out on the table. Then the spirit would come through the doorway there into our room and walk around our bed and grab our legs and stuff. And it was just horrible. I mean, we were petrified kids for a long time. We lived with this, you know, and, and this this is the first time I've ever told anybody, you know, and I know a lot of people are hearing this right now. But Yeah, it's not something you would, yeah, but it's a better way to be able to, tell this kind of thing really uh, because th what people would think if you told them this yeah and uh, I tell you we've had we've had so many things happen Art it's it's I could go on and on and on well you, you, we're the ones we're the ones that had the rocks raining on us the rocks this, raining on you yes this is very true in California Missouri it rained rocks on us for three days Yep, I, I know. Someone else gave us that a little while ago. I, I find that, you know, I have a hard time with that one. Three days of rocks. Should have had uh, lots of pictures, huh? <laughs> East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello? Hello. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was me. Uh, yes, um, it is. Where are you? I'm in uh, Hickson, Tennessee. Yes, ma'am. My name is Mary. I've been listening to you for a long time. How is your back, by the way? Uh, actually, Mary, it's better than it's been in a long, long time. Good. I'm glad. I, we missed you. Well, I did anyway. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the attacks also. Okay. All my life, I've myself and my family have been attacked by things 
with most of the time it's in the bed or in the bedroom. Yep, that seems to be almost, almost a constant. In fact, uh, one night something was grabbing my hand like it was trying to pull me out of bed. Oh. And another night I woke up, I couldn't breathe, and I just saw two red eyes and this black figure. Red eyes. Red eyes. I hate red eyes. I don't like them either. <laughs> it scared me. And yeah. that happened more than once. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. It was like a battle of will. Yeah. That's the only way I could describe it was a battle of will to get this thing off of me. I have had out-of-body experiences, and I've been chased by them. I know. I, 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 I really like to ask this question. If you hadn't resisted, if you had let this thing, uh, this black thing with red eyes, proceed to what it was going to do, if you'd been frozen in fear and couldn't have moved, what do you think would have happened? Well, I was frozen, but it wasn't in fear. I just couldn't move. But I think it was trying to take me over. I, b I believe this. Possession. Yeah. And it's not just myself this has happened to. It's happened to my husband. It's happened to my, a couple of my brothers. Well, the thing about possession is we have no way of knowing how many possessed people there are. Uh, I mean, it may well be that the changes in personality, at least in the beginning, are fairly subtle. But the, uh, the possession increasingly takes control once it occurs. And how would we ever know, any of us here on Earth, uh, how many are really possessed? I don't know about anyone else, but I've always, I can feel if there's something wrong with people. And I can usually see it in their aura. Well, there certainly are people where, you know, you just immediately know something is really wrong. I believe my father was possessed because he was one of the most evil men I ever met in my life. Your own father? My own father. I believe he was possessed because he enjoyed hurting people. And he didn't care who knew. And he was charismatic. He was like the devil incarnate himself. You mean in other ways he was charismatic? He, he, uh... Yeah. He could be cruel and mean, and nobody seemed to see it. Huh. Even though he was being mean and cruel to them. It's like they didn't even, they couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. But I've always had a sense about it, and people that were like that, I just, I, I can't be around. The satin shiv, you know. I don't know what it is, but I've, I'm real sensitive to, I guess, spirits and things. I see things, I know things. Scary things. <laughs> well, I know maybe, when maybe, I know when people are going to die. Maybe. I, oh, you do. Yeah. I was going to say maybe it simply runs in the family. In well, some I think a lot of it has to do with the Indian background in our family. Oh. Because Indians tend to be more inclined to be open to spirits, and I believe my mother, her her family was, her line was medicine woman. Well, you've got a pretty serious background there. Yeah. And so I, I guess that accounts for a lot of it. Uh, I wonder why she, though, with her sensitivity, ended up uh, uh, marrying a man who had this incredible uh, mean streak. Well, hers, hers was more in the healing arts. She was, she could heal with anything. She had a lot of the. Uh, used a lot of the Indian ways to heal. But why would you have been attracted to such a mean man? Have you I'm ever... not sure. Uh -huh. I think it was, she was her second husband, and he promised to take care of her and her family mm. and treat her kids as if they were his own, but he didn't.